Hey, this is Jeff Nyquist, and uh, here's another edition of Friends and Enemies. We're going to have a, a rather interesting discussion today about Carl Jung and, and then, of course, Jordan Peterson, who was influenced by Jung, and about the political, uh, I guess you could say, the political significance of Jung, the philosophical and the moral significance in the, in the end. And, of course, we've got, uh, I've got in this book, um, Arian Christ, and maybe for two weeks we're going to talk about uh, Richard Knoll's book about Jung, which is important. He also wrote The Jung Cult. Um, and there's a lot of things we can talk about and learn uh, about what, you know, these these occult influences and mystery cults. And so um, I should say something about Richard Knoll, who wrote this. He's taught at Harvard and MIT. Uh, but he got his PhD in clinical psychology from the New School of Social Research. So Noel, although I think the book is rather excellent, and I've read criticisms of it, and the criticisms are interesting too, but um, he's very much, I think, a man of the left. And so it's very intriguing when you have the occult, religion, the left, the right, and you've got science, and you've got the question of, of the soul and human nature and the future of humanity all coming together at one place. So, um, so uh, uh, with me is Alex Benish in Germany. I'm in the U.S. So Alex, uh, you've been reading this material. Uh, what do you think of Noel's coverage of uh, Carl Jung? Um, I, I think the, the analysis by Richard Knoll is Richard Knoll is accurate. However, uh, Knoll is not Knoll is not looking at the entire uh, the entire life of uh, Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, he's he's only looking at the early uh, Carl Jung, and um, and he also does not apply the same level of scrutiny when it comes to um, icons of the left. So this is something that I see quite a bit, especially in the last few years when we had the the explosion or the next level of, you know, traditional conspiracy media, the new right wing and all that. Um, so the bigger this conspiracy movement got, the more you saw these left wing or sort of left wing um, social scientists, shrinks, you know, psychologists. So uh, they, they try to counter that right wing movement. And usually when you see some of this analysis from the left, it's somewhat accurate, but they never ever apply the same level of scrutiny when it comes to their own side and their own icons. And, and so I think people should keep that, um, keep that in mind. It's like targeting, it's almost like warfare, really. It's, it's almost like in warfare, you attack the enemy where he is weak. You, you find a spot where the enemy is weak, and that's where you concentrate your forces. You do not attack where the enemy is strong. And I, I think that that's sort of the underlying strategy um, of Richard Knoll, because all, all this stuff that he has to say about Carl Gustav Jung, all this stuff, um, you could apply the same method to, let's say, uh, Karl Marx or many of, of Marx's contemporaries. Um, people who got into the occult um maybe even more so than Jung or into more dangerous types of cults than than Jung was a part of um and also real life communism um real life real actual real life communism was created as a cult movement anything about it is a cult movement Karl Marx is viewed as sort of the the prophet you know in this in this communist cult Marx is sort of the prophet Lenin is the revolutionary messiah figure to some degree. That's Lenin. And so anything communist is holy. It's sacred to, to the left. Uh, and, and, and so they defended these, these ideas um, like the Inquisition. So they wanted to just, just destroy anybody who was voicing doubt, anybody who was uh, reigning on their parade, right? So, uh, and, and you had to... You had to pretend to love communism. I mean, so you can see that still in, in North Korea when, you know, the dictator dies, uh, everybody has to cry. I mean, it, it's, it's, you're obligated to cry. And if you don't cry in front of a camera, you're in trouble. Uh, and the same thing when the government tells you to be happy, you have to clap like you're an, you're an idiot and, you know, smile a lot. Um, why, why just selective targets? Okay, so... Um, 
uh, I think Noel's, Noel's study is important, but it is incomplete. And um, and so we try, we're trying to f uh, figure out in this in this show what is what is valuable what is valuable information, what is valuable criticism, and we're trying to fill in the blank spots. Uh, and also, we want to create sort of the the segue into the modern era with people like Jordan Peterson. Now, Jordan Peterson, yeah. he's has he's strongly influenced by. Um, by uh, Carl Gustav Jung, and I think he shares some of the same shortcomings. Um, even though we can, it's it's more forgivable uh, when we talk about the shortcomings of Jung because he lived, you know, from 1875 to 1961. Um, whereas Jordan Peterson has access to modern research on organized evil. You know, just there's so much new new stuff. But still, Peterson seems to think we can solve evil. We can solve all the problems by just applying some old Jungian concepts and just I call it I call it warmed warmed over Freemasonry. That's that to me is the philosophy of Jordan Peterson. We're just using stories and allegories and we want to create the hero, the hero's journey. We improve the man we improve man with these stories so he becomes a hero and does good things. That sounds exactly like Freemasonry to me. Uh, and I don't think we okay, can Okay, let, let's uh, let, let's talk a little bit about what Young what Young's work was and um, about his background, a little bit about his biography. He was born in 1875 and his grandfather had been had known uh, Goethe. His grandfather was from Germany, but uh, because one of his grandfather's friends had assassinated a government official, his grandfather wasn't wanted in Germany. He bounced to Paris. His grandfather was a physician, by the way, like him, also named Karl uh, Gustav Jan, but he was Karl with a K. And his grandfather ended up in Switzerland. And, um, and of course, that's where Carl Jung was born. But uh, what Noel makes a big deal out of is, is that Carl Jung was proud of his German grandfather and his German background and ancestors. Um, and of course, uh, he ties this into Carl Jung's early dalliance with the Third Reich, with the Nazis, which he turned against, uh, to, to Jung's credit. But it's very important because I think overall, uh, Jung ends up being, if you look at the totality of his work, he ends up becoming a conservative voice of warning uh, about a uh, man moving away from religion and religious traditions, which is something that someone like Noel who was on the far left, I think, doesn't really like. Because no, what's interesting is Noel, who's written this, these two books trying to destroy Jung's reputation, Noel has been in parapsychology labs. He studied the occult. He went to China and Mongolia uh, to study shamans, right? So it's not like Noel is against the left's dalliances with the occult. He's just against a conservative figure who has this incredible reputation, which was Jung. And, and of course, Jordan Peterson is considered to be on the right too, but of course is pro-Russian for some reason, as you're pointing out, and is okay with Ukraine being crushed. When here is where you get to, to Jung. Jung in his later life was all about talking about evil and about the dangers of nuclear war and he, there's a sense of guilt in Jung and telling people, try to believe in Jesus, try to go back to church, telling them this in his later years. Noel wants to depict this as hypocrisy. I don't think it, it is. And you see, the thing is, is that whatever a person believes privately, and I don't think Jung was a Christian, um, he, it, what he said publicly, what he was trying to teach people was his serious work was he was trying to influence people to do something. And he had reasons for it. Um, and I think you can find the same thing in Peterson. But whereas uh, Jung collaborated with the OSS against Hitler in the end um, and, and came to realize that communism, Jung said communism is a concentrated antichrist force in history, is what Jung said in his book Aeon. He talked about communism and antichrist together these are unforgivable things for Young to have done to the left mm -hmm. um, and absolutely unforgivable and to tell people to go back to church. When you, when you go to, um, when, if you want to understand the beginning of Young's career, 
Jung was absolutely obsessed with the with knowing whether the soul survives death when he was young. And that now explaining Jung, Jung Jung's grandfather converted to from Catholicism to Protestantism. So his father was a Protestant minister, Jung's father. And his maternal grandfather was not only a pro Protestant minister, but there in Basel, Switzerland, was the dean of the Protestant ministers in Basel, Switzerland. But this is so weird. How do you explain it? That maternal grandfather, who was the number one pastor in that community in Switzerland, talked to dead people, mm -hmm. conducted seances, had was into spiritism or spiritualism, whatever, and including which caused his mother and his aunts and his cousins, all kinds of folks. And there was, Jung would say, there was some talent there that they actually had experiences, right, with this phenomenon, which furthered Jung's obsession. So when people say Jung read Kant and Jung read um, Schopenhauer, he didn't wasn't really interested in their metaphysics or their philosophy. He was interested in their writings. Each of them wrote books on, S, I think Schopenhauer's book was Essay on Spirit Seers. And there was a similar title by Kant, I can't remember, but that's what Jung was interested in. And aside from his medical work, working to be a doctor and become a psychologist, he wrote every, he read everything he could on s touching on the soul and survival. And um, I guess you could say the occult. Yeah. This was Jung's obsession when he was young was with these experiences. So, and this is, I think this is, I may be wrong, this may be different than Peterson. Because Peterson strikes me, although he's interested in this, Peterson strikes me as, as now Jung was trained as an empirical scientist, and he, his official work, he did it all as empirical science, and I think he did good work, because I've read a lot of it, and it's, it sounds sound, psychologically sound. But his, Jung said, I am a metaphysical dualist. I believe in the spirit world, or the world of the, you know, a God where God and the spirits and whatever is there, and I believe in the physical world. I'm not sure Peterson has that. I think Peterson is a, I think Peterson is a materialist. Um, I, I'm not sure that he believes in any religion, really. I think he sees it as, and you talk about, um, a tool. it was interesting what you said about uh, Peterson soft peddling a kind of diffuse uh, Freemasonry, yeah. right? I think there's something to that. Whereas Jung was reaching beyond that and had an actual journey. Jordan Peterson got addicted to opiates, ended up in Russia, being treated in Russia for those opiates, end mm. up being flacking for Russia in his political statements. Yeah. I mean, to me, uh, I mean, people have to realize when, uh, when British British Freemasonry started, right? This was in 1717, so just like three years after the uh, the the new king, uh, King George the First from Hanover, who actually came from Germany or parts of Germany and spoke German. Uh, so this was like this was the 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 big shift in Britain. So they had a new leadership, and that lasted for a long time, and then the the relatives then continued on until this very day, um, and so that. This new era, okay, the new leadership in Britain, and um, and they also had, uh, they also had uh, a scientific organization restarted. Um, the royal, they call it the Royal Society, and so the Royal Society for Science and British Freemasonry are actually sister organizations. Many people don't know that, and even some of the core early statutes of Freemasonry have a strong emphasis on science. Now. Um, so uh, and Isaac uh, Newton was into this stuff. He was into oh, yeah, astrology yeah. I mean, and numerology. The, the, the Royal Society existed earlier with, with the old British leadership, and and back in the old days, the Royal Society was full of Rosicrucians. So they were just completely into the occult. Um, and so and, at a later oh, stage, by the way, we might we might kind of maybe try to describe where Rosicrucian what it is and where it came from. And I, in I read a book last week which stunned me because I didn't know this is a person who knows. Jacques Vallee personally, that J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallee, the Project Blue Book scientists, 
from the 1960s were privately Rosicrucians. They not belonging to any group, but believed in that philosophy. Yeah. And that's why Heineck called his group the Invisible College, because that's an old um, that's an old phrase from the Rosicrucians. But I, I should just tell people, where does the Rosicrucianism come from? It comes from the middle of the 1600s. There were a couple pamphlets popped up saying there were these people that had these special insights and powers and whatever. Mr. Rosenkreuz. So, yes. The, Mr. Rosenkreuz. the mysterious Mr. Rosenkreuz. Um, Herr Rosenkreuz. But, it, it, but it, was he a real person? Did any of this exist? But people started spontaneously, uh, it seems, uh, creating these groups. These, that is, it, the suggestion of it existing brought it into existence, that people started creating mm, these groups. Yeah. And of course, there had been since the fall of Byzantium, uh, when manuscripts from the old library at Alexandria that had been moved to Byzantium, when Byzantium fell, these things came flooding into Italy. So you had Hermetic writings, you had Platonism, Plotinus, you had these writings coming to Florence, where the Medici family was translating, had, having everything translated. And in fact, they put a stop to everything when they got the Hermetic writings, because these were report, reportedly from ancient Egypt. They were the oldest supposed wisdom from Thoth, you know, Hermes, the thrice great. Um, and so this, this started, and there were also some manuscripts that ended up in Spain as well, some things that it, so there was both coming out of Spain and coming out of the Jews in Spain because they were the ones that were bringing this out of the Muslim world, because the Muslims have plundered all these ancient, you know, Babel, mm. Babylon was in the Muslim world after all. They, these were pouring out, and so you had these heretical thoughts in the West, in the Christian West, and you had this dabbling in mysticism in the occult that started. And so by the time you get to the 1600s, there's a kind of this explosion. And of course, you have two kinds of, you have Rosicrucian lodges spontaneously forming out of what, who knows. And then you have at the same time, and I think they're just, they're grabbing onto these hermetic, they're, they're reading Plotinus, you know, and, and so on. And then you have, of course, Freemasonry emerging out of this, just to, just to give people yeah. the background on where so this came from. So it's like, it's almost like they try to ha separate these two things for organizational purposes. So instead of having, you know, a scientific organization, the Royal Society, uh, being engaged in Rosicrucianism, they just wanted to have, you know, just just for for a better organization, they started British Freemasonry and also the new renewed Royal Society for Science, and and so that new organization and the new leadership that made. Britain, ultimately, uh, over the span of you know, more almost a hundred years, uh, that made Britain the most successful empire in the world. They were shooting and, past and Britain. Britain yeah. was a kind of an empire that they took scientific ideas from everybody. It's like Sweden invented modern yeah. scientific bureaucracy, and it went to Holland, and it it affected the efficiency of commerce and government, and the British just adopted it, and it just made them a superpower overnight. Yeah, and and this and, was in the 18th century. Yeah, because when, uh, when I mean, so Britain was taking in all these yeah. ideas, both good and bad. Yeah. So when when uh, when King King George the uh, First started. Britain, in many ways, was behind France. You know, France had more space, France had more people, this and that. Uh, but a hundred years later, uh, the situation had changed completely, and at some point, Britain became this. Britain became this uh, this behemoth of an empire, and so. In the uh, seven years, what what we call the French and Indian War here in America, seven years you guys war. call the Seven Years War. Yeah. Yeah. This was a war, this was a, a war that was fought on all over the world. Um, it was and, a world uh, war. It was really yeah. the first world war. Yeah. yeah. It's a and, massive and, thing. And, it's you massive. know, people don't realize the British captured the Philippines, captured Cuba, destroyed the Spanish treasure fleet during this war. They, they crushed the French Navy. They took India from France. They took Canada from France. You talk about all fighting all over the world. It really was. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, the Prussian king, Frederick the Great, was the main only ally the British had. The British were defeating everybody at sea, but on land, it was Frederick the Great was holding off Austria and Russia and France, right? He said he was surrounded by three women, yeah. you know, 
uh, the the uh, Elizabeth the Russian Empress, um, M Maria Theresa of Austria, and of course Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of King Henry the Fifteenth. I mean King yeah. uh, Louis the Fifteenth. But um, yeah, so this this was a tremendous war. That it actually was the war that made the yeah. British Empire. Yeah, and also yeah. it's it's it seems very paradoxical. Okay, so when um, so Freemasonry, well, let's talk about British British Freemasonry. Um, when they describe themselves, they will tell you that they will take a man which is just not perfect yet or is not ready yet to, to do good in this world, to do special things. And they, 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 they take this man and they improve him. They bring him up to, up to you know, standard. And they're doing this by using allegories and these old stories, these archetype stories about heroism uh so for example they will they will tell an old story about um somebody who had the secrets of you know the temple secrets and uh these three ruffians they want to they threaten him and they want the secret out of him uh, and he refuses to to hand over the secret and then they kill him uh so by telling these ancient stories really um opening the gate to to the ancient world um by doing so they will create better men who will do moral things they always talk about morals and morals and morals so um so the first paradoxical thing of course is the british empire and how it conducted itself because it was a very traditional empire in many ways It was using force, uh, it was using trade, it was using every intelligence, it was using every tool it and, had. And this is where, where the people like the Irish and the French and those who were the enemies of, of Britain came up with this phrase, perfidious Albion. <laughs> Albion is just another word for the British, perfidious Albion, that they, the British are going to, you know, or as the Indians would say in North America, white man speak with forked tongue, hmm. you know. Yeah, it's like um, the Indians it's like, liked the French; they didn't like the British. Yeah, so it's it seems paradoxical when we when you know this this new version of the British Empire uh, through Freemasonry was talking about morals, yet the empire behaved the way it did in colonies such as India, and there's some interesting studies on that. I think it was uh, the last one I read was uh, Shashi Tharoor's "What the British Did to India." Uh, so that's paradoxical, of course, but at the same time. Um, without science, if you really understand history, without modern science, um, it was almost not affordable to have institutionalized, codified morals. Because every empire in the past was so fragile, they were afraid, because so many empires came and went, they feared if they give people more liberty, if they give people more prosperity, um, if they let people participate in the political process, this could lead to instability and then you get taken over by a traditional evil empire. So um, one could argue that it, it needed modern science uh, for you know food production and other production to uh, give us a better chance than ever before um, of having institutionalized morals or just professional advanced uh, morals in the way we, we live. So the science, the science gave us a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of dangers. So it's like this triple, quadruple paradox when we look at the British Empire. Um, and so, um, yeah, so you got to be really careful when it comes to these um, these mystery school influences because no mis uh, mystery cults are not always the same. When you look at ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and some other significant empires in the ancient world um there were so many of these cults and some of them some of them were not really that dangerous okay so as far as archaeologists and some other experts can tell us um they were experimenting with psychedelic drugs they used other methods to achieve altered states of mind they were trying to come up with something new and and um and uh they were experimenting also with you know baseline morals in society you know what is what is what is adequate what is not adequate and they were they were just experimenting a lot so some of these what, mystery what, what is interesting ab about the ancient world and uh, about carl jung is carl jung wanted to know whether the soul survived death when he was young he was obsessed with this he also because his family his grandfather spoke to dead people 
he also wanted to understand um, this idea of communicating with the dead. other non-human mm, beings, yeah. right? And the dead. And of course, this was his father died when he was fairly young. Um, and, and you had more people dying in, in, in families in those days. And of course, people were very worried. I mean, they, they had some of the people they loved the most were dead. And they wanted to believe that they were going to be reunited with them. And the ancient world is the same thing. All the ancient world was abuzz at one time with talk about, are the angels good or bad? You know, and the yeah. word angel means messenger. Um, so that, that um, much of ancient paganism was based on techniques for not only divination, but techniques for communicating with, you know, what we would call demons. They called, the ancient Greeks would call them diamonds. Right, the demonic. They believed in a demonic reality full of gods and non-human intelligences yeah. that humanity had to somehow get along with. And so this was, and this was both in the Egyptian, the Roman, the Babylonian, uh, and the Greek religions, the the polytheistic yeah. religions. So not yeah. all. So not not all of these uh, ancient mystery cults were psychopathic, and and not all of them did sadistic those, crazy those some were crazy rituals well yeah that's the thing i mean we we do have um we do have archaeological evidence um and 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 uh and some some pretty interesting information about some of these um older empires in uh in the americas for example like like where Mexico now is and further to the oh, south. Oh, yes, the, the, the great towers. Moloch that they were feeding there by sacrificing yeah, so, victims so they were, they were their cutting, hearts out when they were cutting still feeding, yeah. Cutting people's hearts out in front of a crowd. This was not done in secret. You know, it's not like people think of the Illuminati in, in more modern times, you know, doing this in a secret basement in a, in a castle somewhere. This was in public. This was, this was in, in front of a crowd uh, cutting people's hearts out. And also um, we have these skull towers, so people dug out dug out these gigantic towers made of uh, human skulls from people that were sacrificed uh, and cement. So you could actually make a huge tower out of these human remains. Um, and also which, modern. Which was the this was the Aztecs, and uh, there's a there's a movie Mel Gibson made called Apocalypto. Apocalypto, yeah. Where he shows this, and it's it's rather people got offended by this movie, but he shows. And one of the scenes in the movie, of course, is these Indians are being hunted as sacrificial victims by the Aztecs. And this one kid is being chased down a beach and you see the Spanish conquistadors yeah. arriving and you think, see, we're trained to believe those conquistadors were evil, but you're seeing yeah. those conquistadors arriving and you're going, oh, thank goodness they've arrived um, because these people are just being yeah, so, slaughtered and, by this ritual also, sacrifice massacre. And also nowadays we know about psychopaths. We know about... Um, the the inability to uh to have empathy you know uh some people are wired in a way uh that they derive pleasure from the the misery and the suffering of innocent people it's exciting to them and it's and uh if if you wrap it into a religious context there you have a satanic or what you could call a satanic ritual a psychopathic ritual uh, we know psychopaths exist now. We know how their brains are, and we know the genetics of it that play uh, like a significant part of that. Um, yeah, so you, you, people have to take this very, very seriously. And also, this Richard Knoll guy that we were talking about, and you know, I have notes about Richard Knoll's analysis on on Jung. So Knoll is trashing Jung for getting into a soft version of the mystery cults. Um, and uh, and then we saw Noel criticizing, we saw Noel criticizing um, American psychiatry during the satanic panic of the 1980s and 90s. And I've I've studied this this area uh, this this uh, time as well. So maybe I can talk talk about that um, later. Um, so so you have to take it seriously. There are psychopaths, and they've there always were psychopaths, and they would be. Uh, interested in having human sacrifice, some very, very evil um, psychopathic rituals. So you have to take this seriously. This is not just a myth, but also you cannot associate any mystery cult with the psychopathic activity. It's just not history. So um, what I think, what I think um, 
Carl, Carl Gustav Jung got into was, I think he got into a soft version of these Greek uh, and some Roman mystery cults, like the Mithras cult. And, um, and so uh, 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 this is something that, that this is something that, that can be very, very different for, to, to compare to what the Nazis were into, their brand of occultism, and also the brand of occultism that we've talked about in the previous show, which is the Russian occultism with Alexander Dugin. And, and Dugin took stuff from the Nazi occultism, so they and, feed and off the, of each the other. And the cronyism, the human sacrifice, the cronyism. Yeah. You know, you were, you know, just to show it isn't just archaeological evidence we have about really dangerous mystery cults. Uh, if you, I've got, this is, um, you know, this is Livy, Titus Livy. Uh, they, they published this Penguin Classics, Livy, Rome and the Mediterranean, but it's actually in book 29 of the surviving books of Titus Livy. He's a Roman historian who lived at the time of Christ. Uh, and uh, it's, it's part eight of book 29. And he writes about um, uh, this trouble that came from Greece to Rome. And he says the trouble started with the arrival in Etruria of a Greek of humble origin. And he wasn't really, he said he wasn't, this guy wasn't really educated. <clears throat> he dealt in sacrifices and soothsaying. But his method of infecting people's minds with error was not by the open practice of his rites and public advertisements of his trade and his system. He was the hierophant of secret ceremonies performed at night. There were initiations which at first were imparted only to a few, but they soon began to be widespread among men and women. The pleasures of drinking and feasting were added to the religious rites to attract a large number of followers. When wine had inflamed their feelings, and night and the mingling of the sexes and of different ages had extinguished all power of moral judgment, all sorts of corruption began to be practiced since each person had ready to hand the chance of gratifying the particular desire to which he was naturally inclined. This is, this, by the way, when is this happening? This is in the early 2nd century BC, mm. that this part of Roman history. So this was happening after the Second Punic War, after the defeat of Hannibal, when morals, Rome was a very moral society. It was pagan, but they had a high uh, degree of conscientiousness. This came from Greeks to them. And they had to actually, they had a problem. They were afraid this was going to wipe them out. And they had a real struggle with this, as Livy tells yeah. the story. It's a fascinating story. And this is, so the idea that these things, they can't be benign, but they can be extremely dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have this quote here. It says that, um, uh, it's about, um, it's about this idea that that we all can access this these ancient archetype stories and they, that that will empower us. Uh, it says here um, uh, in his first published theory uh, about this specific topic in 1911, Jung introduces the idea that his f uh, phylogenetic layer contains the mythological images and thinking of pagan antiquity. Therefore, when Jung's use of language is analyzed to reveal his intent, it is a decidedly pre-Christian layer that has been covered up by centuries of Judeo-Christian sediment. Uh, Jung advocates deliberately cutting through centuries of strangling Judeo-Christian underbrush to reach the promised land of the impersonal psyche, a pre-Christian pagan land of the dead, and to thereby be revitalized. And um, uh, to prove this, to prove his theory of a collective unconscious, this is the same stuff that Jordan Peterson talks about, uh, to prove his theory, Jung cited the recurring independent appearances of the same archetypes in mythological traditions and in the delusions of his psychiatric patients, particularly one patient known as the solar phallus man, whose hallucination of a phallic son paralleled a vision described in the ancient Mithraic liturgy. However, Noel delivers, Noel delivers a severe blow to these claims. First, he points out that the patients in the hospital where Jung conducted his research had ample opportunities to learn about ancient mythology. Next, he documents that the solar phallus man, this weird patient, uh, could indeed have had access to information about the Mithraic liturgy, and that in order to conceal this fact, Jung deliberately misrepresented several important details. 
surrounding the case. So it, it seems to be like a, he, he, Jung wanted this to be true. He wanted to have found the key to understanding everything and to fix everything. And so it seems like it's the same thing that I see in Jordan Peterson. And he has been criticized for his first book um, about the very same point. You know, uh, Peterson makes this argument, which is the same argument that, that Jung had, had provided, um, that everywhere in the world, all these cultures, they had the same stories. They had the same archetype stories, but they're actually significant differences. So it's not the same everywhere. Um, uh, Peterson is looking at those examples that fit his argument. Yeah, and right? if you go to Mexico, you got mass human sacrifice. And yeah. I, I should correct myself, you know, when I said that, that this can be harmless, what I mean is that there could be people that can have some silly beliefs, right? That, that, that they don't act on them. Nothing really comes of these beliefs. They can be interested in, in uh, some mythology of some tribe somewhere, and it doesn't involve them in ritual human sacrifice or destroying their own or other people's lives. Uh, so, uh, but I think that the, the problem is, is that there is real objective evil. And I think that's what Jung came to understand. And Gordon Peterson talks about evil too, but he doesn't seem to understand yet because of his willingness to see a whole nation be crushed by Russia. Um, uh, I, I think that's not, you know that's not acceptable as as a good thing. You 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 can't be for the extermination of innocent people, the sacrificing of innocent people for your own comfort and safety. That can't be right. Um, but um, but yeah, it's um, Jung's influence as a uh, as a psychiatrist he was very guarded about letting other people know about his interest in the occult and talking to the dead i mean this is stuff that w didn't generally get out he kept it in his own family circle and the people around him and they were very they have been very protective of him and it was actually by the way it was actually because of no i read in some of the the literature about this that jung's red books his diaries that were written before 1927, I believe, about his occult experiences, his dreams, his visions, his precognitive dreams that he had, um, were published in answer to Noel, Noel's criticism, hmm. because they they wanted to present it. And of course, Noel later, I think, has said that they sanitized it. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I, I, I haven't finished reading this book yet. But it's it's very interesting to me that um, that in this particular mix, we, we have, remember that it was Nietzsche and, and others in the, and, and arguably Hegel, uh, according to Eric Virgil and Hegel, was in, they were basically destroyers of Christianity. Yeah. Because they, because, you know, it was Nietzsche that said, his God is dead and you have killed him. But it was Hegel who said, we're going to have Christianity and basically it's not going to be Christian. Is, yeah, and also, I mean, why, why, ultimately, why was why was Lenin buried in a mausoleum, which was a direct copy of an ancient temple, right? So it's of not a pyramid. It, it's, it's actually a pyramid. It's not. It's not. It's not as, as if uh, it's not as if you know Jung was 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 uh, Jung was the only person uh, who was fascinated with the ancient world and also a broader movement and and i have this in the notes here brought a movement in germany and switzerland uh for a while right because you have to imagine imagine if you lived at that time in germany right so nobody mm -hmm. knows what direction to to uh to try out you know should you have a res should you have a full monarchy uh, should you have a half monarchy like the British or should you try a full republic like America? Um, should you have religion? Should you not have religion? Should you revive the ancient um, the ancient traditions or leave the ancient traditions? These were the questions on people's minds. And um, and of course, the the uh, the national socialists, they would um, the national socialists um they had access to early psychology so they could target their propaganda they could tailor their propaganda to tell people different segments of the population what they wanted to hear and so when you t 
so the the Nazis presented themselves as a Roman movement, and you can see that. I mean, just around the corner here, you can see the big place where they had the the rallies, uh, very Roman architecture and structure, and and all the the design. Uh, then you have these this big temple. This is in in Nuremberg. Also, it's almost a copy of the uh, the Italian Roman temple of Emperor Augustus. So they copied the Augustus temple and made one in Nuremberg. Um, so they marketed themselves as Roman because that's what people knew. That was what people were familiar with. You know, over the centuries. All these empires here, the British, the French, Germans, Austrians, they all wanted to be the next Rome. But there's uh, something additional. There's something, you see, the thing that's really troubling about Hitler is there's he was more sophisticated than that even. Um, if you really look at what Hitler was doing, more sophisticated than his writings or his book, uh, Mein Kampf and his secret second book, um, Hitler was an artist. He was interested in culture and how culture is upstream from politics. He was not at all um, oblivious to this. So that art and he, so therefore the Nazis were trying to reshape the entire culture. And of course the SS, a lot of people don't know about the SS, which was headed by Heinrich Himmler, was that it, it had this enormous cultural mission. The SS originally started as a bunch of research bureaus and think tanks and uh, groups of researchers, and they got all these academics and aristocrats into the SS, people who had refined concepts. And this is one of the things that Julius Evola, that Dugan is so interested in. Evola got interested in the SS and said, look, this is a new elite for, this is the new aristocracy maybe for all of Europe, for a united Europe. And um, they've got this sophisticated, of course, the SS looked at Ebola and said, oh, we're suspicious of him because they wanted to be the designers of a culture and that they thought they wanted to think everything through. That is, rather than having an organic culture that just sort of developed spontaneously, they wanted to actually construct one from the ground up. And Hitler had this vision. And of course, this kind of construction involves killing a lot of people and erasing and falsifying a lot of things. And it's, it's very much the Soviets were doing the same thing in the Soviet Union on a massive scale. They were eradicating. It's like I mentioned, all the Ukrainian folk singers and poets were rounded up, just a few that escaped, and they wanted to eradicate and destroy them all. Talk about this that Putin claiming the Soviets were preserving, wanting to preserve Ukrainian culture. No, they wanted to make a Soviet new man. The Nazis were also making their Aryan Superman. So th this, these very dangerous experiments in which they're using all of social science and all of the understandings. And by the way, as you pointed out, but the occult is underlying in both. There's occultists working in the background behind the the far left and the far right and yeah, their ideas are not that the, much different the concept yeah the concept of the mechanisms of of a dangerous mystery cult um that can be applied to any country at any time at any point in history uh, i mean you had uh, uh you know you had uh uh, mystery cults surviving in the Muslim world, or you had the the the, the Young Turk lodges uh, destroying the caliphate. You can apply this to almost any target group, right? Um, and uh, I have something here. This is from from Knoll's analysis on Jung, uh, where he gives sort of the background, uh, which I was alluding to. You know how far reaching, how far reaching uh, the the outright love was uh, for the Roman Empire and ancient Greece. I mean, in, in the higher schools, the universities, this was everywhere. Um, and uh, now, of course, when Noel, when Noel talks about it, it's, it sounds like he's, Noel, Noel is complaining about elitism. He's just lumping it all together. You know, if, if, if you think you can do something better, then that's dangerous, even though that's essential to progress, right? If you have a healthy competition, uh, people want, wanting to excel, 
um, you know, healthy hierarchies and, and also real real life communism needed hierarchies as well. And they also were very selective about the persons they would uh, they would promote. So it says it says this um, a. A third relevant but often understated aspect of Jung's early years is the dominance of classical Greco-Roman culture in the educational philosophy and in the schools of German Europe of this era. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the important people uh, prolonging this trend was Johann Joachim Winkelmann. Goethe called it Winkelmann's heroic Gewahrwerden der griechischen Kunst, his finding of Greek art it's actually not a not a wholly correct uh uh, uh translation by the way gewahr werden i mean it's it's like it's it, the german the german language can sometimes be very imprecise you know with certain terms that's why karl marx used certain woozy terms because it sounds almost you know hidden and magical um the image of ancient greece as an idyllic serene rational golden age of truth and beauty painted by Winkelmann in his works, dominated German culture until the end of the 19th century. Ancient Greece, in this depiction, was pure, never vulgar, the birthplace of genius, not degeneracy, and therefore it became an ideal that German culture sought to emulate. Uh, now, of course, um, uh, of course, you, ca you, cannot, you cannot blame somebody for, uh, you know, for this type of optimistic or unrealistic view of history okay uh you cannot blame somebody for um dreaming about a future that is healthy and, and you know all these geniuses running around uh you can't blame people for that and it's like it's almost as if Knoll is using a uh classic marxist leninist framing so the moment you are interested in your ancestors nation states or or traditions the moment you get into that stuff it can only lead to evil it doesn't necessarily lead to evil it did in the case of the nazis but that was due to a lot of other factors um, yeah and so I, I should point this out that that in the ancient world greece and rome and ancient egypt were profoundly conservative societies um, they were societies that, uh, among their basic beliefs, is that man had this tendency to degenerate. And, of course, the idea of man as a sinful creature, as a fallen creature, really is found in the ancient pagan world. It's found in ancient Greece and Rome and Egypt, um, that, that, that human nature has corruption in it. And, of course, uh, th they had the belief there was a golden age, there was a time before long years ago where where man was better but man had degenerated from that time um so they 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 saw everything as any they didn't believe in progress like we do and and now you see what one of the problems with modernity is this we're profoundly uh, uh not like the ancients in that we're not conservative we don't conserve we, we look forward to the future thinking, oh, things are going to get better. Our golden age, especially for the Marxists and the left, is in the future, right? And we're going to attain it. And, of course, the reality is, is no, you're just going to degenerate yourself faster, is what an ancient Roman or a Greek philosopher or an Egyptian sage would say to you. You're just going to degenerate yeah. yourself faster with that progress stuff. you got to hold to your traditions. you got to hang on to something solid. And, and of course... When you get to Jung with his experimentation, Jung was very much influenced, of course, by this idea that there was these answers in ancient Greece, in ancient Rome. Um, and, 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 of course, that is the pagan antiquity, which then you, puts you at odds with Christianity and the Christian uh, culture. Yeah, so, and it says here, um, uh, Greek mythology became a dominating point of reference in the works of literary figures of German high culture, especially in the works of Goethe. Through Goethe and the German Romantics and through the widespread adoption of the teaching of Latin and Greek in secondary schools and universities, almost everyone had some familiarity with Greco-Roman mythology and culture 
or could cite passages from pagan authors that would be commonly re recognized, such widespread familiarity among persons at many levels of society in German Europe could seem quite mystifying to British or American visitors. And they actually, uh, he quotes an example of, uh, uh, quotes an example of that when somebody was surprised at how fascinated people were over here uh, with Rome and Greece. Now, I had to learn, I had to learn Latin in school. Uh, and and it, they still do that. So um, uh, you can, you can, you can now ch ch choose not to have that subject. You can choose uh, to something else. Um, but um, they still teach that in schools. They teach you Latin in our schools, especially in Bavaria. Well, I, and, and uh, I should point out that uh, before the World War One, when you had Kaiser Wilhelm, well, Kaiser is the proper Latin pronunciation of Caesar. Uh, he did that's some kind of corruption of Latin. That's um, what do you call a church Latin? to say Caesar, but it's actually, his name was pronounced Kaiser. Yeah. So Kaiser Wilhelm is Caesar Wilhelm, right? Yeah, and so it's like it's like this. When, when you have, according to modern science, when you have uh, m 1% of the population or more than 1% more than of the population being psychopaths, a clinical psychopaths, you know, you could verify that through Psych psychiatrists, you can verify through the genetics and a brain scan. It's, it's all been done. And 16% narcissist and malignant narcissist. Yeah, and malignant <laughs> narcissist. So um, it's uh, sometimes these characters are hard to detect when you don't have them in a clinical setting, when you can brain scan them, when you cannot do a, a genetic analysis of them. Uh, sometimes it's hard to recognize them. And um, and uh, so w you don't know if your neighbor or some some neighbor that you don't know that well, you don't know if this person is a psychopath. And so it's the same when it comes to, uh, you know, people interested in the ancient world or this this Masonic Lodge or that Masonic Lodge or some political movement. I mean, you cannot look into a crystal ball then and the ball will tell you that, you know, this group is dangerous. They're psychopaths. It's a meticulous process you have to do uh, to estimate if a person or a group is indeed dangerous. Now, this is something that I think uh, Carl, Carl Jung was lacking, and I think Jordan Peterson is lacking that as well. It's from the it's the knowledge about the intelligence world because the intelligence world is about acquiring information, um, especially from human sources. So you have to get people to trust you. Uh, you have to um, be able to um, estimate who you'll be working with or how a foreign leader is. So um, we see quite a bit of um, advanced techniques being used by the intelligence agencies. And, and even today, if, if an intelligence agency can get a genetic sample of someone, they can look at the genetic material and determine does he have any specific uh, genes that, could, that are associated with um, a psychopathic brain that develops um so there's all kinds of tools you can you can do i mean uh and uh and so this is part of this task of defeating evil really uh so this was the question that that um uh, carl gustav jung was occupied with how do we get rid of the evil and he tried to do, accomplish this with some nicer forms of you know mystery cults um, and then, of course, he progressed. He matured, and he he became uh, uh, more more uh, more specific and more knowledge about these things. And and I don't think that I don't think that Jordan Peterson has progressed uh, in that sense because he's he's also he's lacking, in my view, the understanding of the intelligence realm, and um, and he's also lacking in applying modern science about evil. Uh, I mean, if you, you can only get so many years of Vladimir Putin in power and you can look at this Russian system only for so long until you have to conclude with a very, very, very high degree of, of uh, probability, Russia is a psychopathic system. It's through and through psychopathic. The leadership is psychopathic. And this trickles down, you know, throughout the, the entire uh, population. And so... Russia may market itself as nice. Uh, the, Russia markets itself as the third Rome, uh, as Christian, but it's a psychopathic 
uh, system run by the KGB, and and they did you happen to see uh, Jordan Peterson's hour plus long? Um, it was done a year ago, July. Um, it was a giant monologue about Ukraine. Did you happen to see that? Um, yeah, I, I have a I have a commentary on that uh, because I I looked at I looked at these things, so I have some notes on that. Yeah. Well, uh, what shocked me, having followed Peterson and having heard Peterson talk about evil and quote Solzhenitsyn, especially quote um, um, uh, Dostoevsky uh, and and so on and and Jung about evil, that he that he would then uh, and you know and talk about the Holocaust before in the past and what the Nazis did that he would that he would come out and he would say basically well we have to avoid nuclear war we have to avoid being hurt ourselves we have to and here's a guy who had stood up against wokeism on the campus in canada and said you know i'm not going to use gender pronouns you know you're gonna have to fire me you're gonna have to put me in jail i'm not going to do it so here's a guy who was who had the courage to stand up against something he thought was wrong but here he's saying we need to run away from something from an evil that's yeah. wrong, and that, and that shocked me because it was so different from what he had been before. He had been this tiger who stood up and said, "I don't care what you do to me," and and he's saying to the West, um, you know, consider safety first. You know, consider your survival chances first rather than what's right or wrong. You know, uh, let these people be slaughtered so that you don't take the risk of being hurt yourself. Um, my gosh, I it, it it bothered me that he had it seemed very inconsistent to me yeah. because you know there 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 are wrong choices in strategy and war there are wrong choices but retrospectively now when we're past two years of the war we have crossed literally fourteen of Putin's red lines where they said they would nuke us and they haven't so that means they were bluffing so. You're going to let evil bluff you into allowing them to murder millions of people and and then yeah. get an opportunity to get stronger and murder millions more? Yeah, I have I commented on this video. Uh, it's called Russia versus Ukraine or civil war in the West. Uh, I think this is the one you're referring to, but he probably talked about the same same topic in multiple videos. Uh, this is where he's uh, he's uh, sitting in front of a blue and black backdrop he's in a suit and he's just on a chair and he's talking about all these things um so i i i commented on that um at the 13 minute mark he basically says that um we shouldn't care about ukraine and the russians need ukraine to feel safe um and also um uh yeah then he's talking about the Christianity in Russia and how they the, the Russians are supposedly against this Western degeneracy. Um, and he called Peterson, uh, Jordan Peterson calls Alexander Dugin a genuine philosopher. Wow, Dugin is an occultist. And uh, we talked about Dugin uh, for quite a bit in one of the previous shows. Um and so yeah, so this goes on and on like this. It's it's very very baseline. It's very primitive to me. Um, and then he says this. Um, this is at the 40, 43 minute mark of the video. He says the following: We cannot do without the Russians on our side. Really? Yes, that's right. He said we cannot do without the Russians on our side, and he said we need. We need Russia to counterbalance China, which is, of course, one of these childish things that you hear again and again coming from the right uh, with people who don't really know what China and Russia are and how closely they've been aligned for decades. Yeah. And so when uh, when I looked at um, when I looked at uh, Jordan Peterson, I mean, I, I started to notice him a couple of years ago when when he became famous and his videos were being recommended by the youtube algorithm and people were writing me i'm i i should look at jordan peterson's lectures 
in these lecture videos, they had interesting titles, so I would click on a few of them, but I would get bored uh, very, very quickly because it always seemed like a bunch of very simple ideas. And he's make he's he's sp sprinkling some big words into his presentation, and he has the suit, he has the look. Um, but I never really found an original thought and I never really found anything that, that I would consider advanced um, because he's, a tr he's trained in, uh, I mean, he, had a he has a degree in political science and psychology and, um, and then a PhD in clinical psychology. So he's an expert on dealing with people with addictions. But then, which is which is very odd because he had a addiction. How can you know he developed a, an addiction himself so bad he had to go to Russia to have it treated? Yeah, I mean you know, that that is really puzzling to yeah, me. Yeah, I mean people. Um, he was he he was always very adamant about this point. You know, he was about telling people you should, you know, face your pain and face your sorrows and face the problems and not use anything to numb it. But then he got hooked on but he on, was I think, doing that he was benzos, actually doing that benzos benzodiazepines and that was at a time when everybody knew how addictive they are i mean my own father was uh uh was addicted to the stuff that was prescribed to him i mean that started in the 70s i think uh and uh so well, they were this, they were getting they were getting people addicted to tranquilizers in the 1940s yeah so i mean know? so uh, i know i know what this looks like and and so nowadays it's in the it's it's in the uh on in you know you can find these this information um in these packages when you when you look at the the information that's presented to you you know you're only supposed to take it for a short period of time um, not turn this into uh, into an addiction, which which is really hard to kick. Um, so he went into this uh, knowing how dangerous this is and knowing what uh, could oh, result. Yeah. And um, well, that's the, the the false moral tone. This is the problem with people. I mean, we all are in danger of this if we become celebrities. We're in danger of uh, not being able to get past ourselves. And then suddenly our our potential for for messing up becomes greater, I think, when we become famous. And Jordan Peterson became a celebrity because he refused to go along with laws enforcing, you know, non-binary gender pronouns. And he risked his career for the sake of free speech. And many of us admired this outspoken, courageous stand. I mean, it was very admirable. This is what made him an important person. Um, but now, in terms of the moral tone of Peterson's discourse, his condemnation of Russian military aggression, which he does pro forma do, it rings hollow. Um, and because his analysis of the Ukraine war is riddled with equivocal statements. And this is the thing, you know, they say drug addicts, uh, one of the things drugs do to you is it makes you equivocal, it makes you morally equivocal. That is, people who are have drug addictions are not, to, you can't trust them. Right. Yeah. They're, they don't really stick by what they do. And 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 so Peterson says things like, well, Putin's is a thug yet. He's a practicing Christian. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, it's also I mean, when when Jordan Peterson took like a year off uh, to get sober, how however they 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 achieved this in Russia. Um, he took a year off and then he came back and he was I, I remember his first videos when he try to make it appear as if his suffering uh because of the addiction because of withdrawal it he made it seem like his uh his suffering was greater than other people's suffering as if it was incredibly special he went through literal hell it's almost like he's a martyr it, he he's, he sounds like he wants to be considered a martyr uh even though there's so many people that got hooked onto benzodiazepines opiates that sort of thing i mean this there's an opioid epidemic in america and it's it's been going on for many years it's, so it's incredible um and it's it's so what happened to to peterson was just so common but he seems to have a problem with you know having a normal problem you know he doesn't want to appear normal he always 
wants to create the aura that he's special and he's especially smart and he's he's on a special mission but that's the sort of thing that i i I see lacking in his work i don't see any any originality and i don't see anything that's that strikes me as as really smart and i read a ton of books i read a ton of books and i always find i always find original stuff i always find really smart stuff it's not like i only consider myself to be smart i i constantly yeah. read and i constantly yeah. find really smart stuff and original stuff i just don't find it from jordan peterson well and you know i've seen peterson some of his work where he does analyze psychologically things and it is quite brilliant um i think we have to admit that he he is capable of doing very good work um but when he says rushes a he says the invasion by Russia of Ukraine is unconscionable. Then he turns around and says that Russia is a bulwark against the moral decadence of the West. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. You cannot be so equivocal. You have to actually, you know, as Machiavelli said, choose a side. You cannot, and, and when this equivocal position turns out to be a, a pro-Russian position, when it's finally analyzed, then you think, no, this is insincerity. This is this is a, a lack of moral discernment, backed with making the right qualifying statements. Um, you know, uh, you know, Peterson says Putin collaborates with the genuine philosopher, as you say, mm-hmm. who, who he calls Alexander Dugan. Uh, no, um, here's Peterson's thesis of the Ukraine war. He this is a quote: "Are we the West degenerate in a profoundly threatening manner?" Right. So we're degenerate in a threatening manner. So that allows then Putin to invade a, a, a country and murder hundreds of thousands of people because we're our decadence is threatening him because we I mean, have... that, that to me is obscene. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, initially, initially, as a young man, Peterson was a member of the New Democratic Party from ages 13 to 18. As a teenager, Peterson decided that religion was for the ignorant, weak and superstitious and hoped for a left-wing revolution, a hope that lasted until he met left-wing activists in college. Well, uh, and so then he became obsessed, it says, with the Cold War and the possibility of a nuclear apocalypse. And then he wanted to work on the big question. Why is the world so evil and crazy and how can we fix it? Now, I mentioned this, I mentioned this earlier. Um, if you want to if you want to answer this question and I've been I've been about this question since I was 6 years old because I you know in Germany Germany is a very dysfunctional country and and it's the, the people here are very very complicated and so um I quoted these numbers a third one one third of the German population is mentally ill in a clinical sense this is the official numbers and that doesn't even include the nar- the undiagnosed narcissists and the psychopaths okay so uh it's, it's not a pleasant place place to be and so i was as a child i was uh baffled by this world um and the more questions i asked you know about what's what's this on television you know what's what's the stuff on the news um what does that mean and so um ima- imagine my father being on prescribed you know benzo benzodiazepines um my father tries to explain to his six-year-old uh, sort of the basic outline of the Cold War. Um, and so I was always about this question, why is the world so crazy and evil? And, um, and it, takes a, it takes a great effort uh, to figure this one out. And it takes so many different fields of science. And you have to read so many different uh, brilliant people. Because there's so much that goes into it. You have to know about history. You have to know about older history. You have to know about techniques of imperialism, the whole military aspect. You know about. You have to know about the intelligence world, psych- psychopathology, the brain, uh, the way groups function or, or, or not function, um, the genetics of evil. There's so many things that, that you have to understand. And so how did Jordan Peterson... Uh, how did Jordan Peterson try to answer this question? Well, he travels to Europe. Um, he takes a year off in the 80s. Uh, he takes a year off, visits Europe, and he reads the works of Carl Jung, Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche, okay? Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Fyodor Dostoevsky, okay? So then he uh, gets home to Canada, gets his BA in psychology, 
uh, than a PhD in clinical psychology. But he's he's always interested in the bigger topics. I mean, he's good at treating or understanding um, addicts, but his real genuine desire was um, to to answer these bigger questions. Right? That's that's really what he was what he's about. And so then in 1999. He publishes his first book. It's called Maps of Meaning. It was published by Routledge. Um, and uh, it took Peterson 13 years to complete the book. Uh, and initially, it basically sold almost zero copies. Um, and uh, there's a good summary on the book. You can find that at um, on the website of Psychology Today. It's a review by Jessica Schrader. The headline is Jordan Peterson's Murky Maps of Meaning. Um, it's a very negative. It's a very negative review, um, and um, she breaks down the message. Okay, so uh, the message is: myths are culturally culturally universal. Myths, according to Peterson, are the psychological origin of morality. Uh, and myths are the philosophical basis for morality, and uh, myth-based morality grounds political judgment, judgments about totalitarian states. Um, well, so and yet, and yet, you know, it's very strange. This is the same guy that that is willing. He's creating a myth of the West is so decadent that Russia should be given free reign to stomp anybody they want. I mean, that's basically, I'm simplifying his thesis, but that's his thesis. And the thing is, is that there's corruption everywhere. Come on, give me a break. Everybody, the Russians are more corrupt than we are in just basic everyday corruption. And the China is too. So their corruption is somehow qualitatively less bad than ours. So we have to let them run over other people. And this is horrifying. I mean, in his book, Hitler and the Germans, the political philosopher Eric Berglund there, he set up a center in Munich there in, in, in uh, Bavaria where you are. He explained that our first reality, our very first reality is a moral reality. That That is truth, right? There is such a thing as truth with a capital T. And those who want to evade the truth with a capital T end up adopting a false reality that permits killing and other horrors, right? This is the essence of moral degeneracy, according to Verglund, this political philosopher. Um, and so in the case of Jordan Peterson, we have a professor who once stood against moral degeneracy, but now he inexplic inexplicably offers an apology for killing other people. Yeah. Yeah. In you, and also, you know, the Russians killing people in yeah. Ukraine. And I and don't also the, understand. And also the, we, I mean, we we understand we understand how the Russian Empire works, and we understand how they would conduct a bigger war in stages. So it's not it's not like uh, it's not like they that Russia would be content with Ukraine or part of Ukraine. And so, but this is all this military, all all these military affairs. This is something that I don't think. Jordan Peterson understands. So he's trying to no. solve this question with philosophy, uh, but it's almost like trying to understand, um, you know, f it's almost like trying to understand uh, mechanical engineering with uh, 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 plant biology. It's just different. It's just two different things. You cannot apply this one field of knowledge, apply it to everything and solve everything. I mean, this is sort well. Of it requires spe actual specific knowledge about the thing you're talking about. But what's really it it is frightening because Verglund wrote that th this kind of cooperation, which Verglund, uh, I mean, which P Peterson's really cooperating with the Russians by saying, "Look, you have permission to do this because the West is degenerate." Uh, it, it's a it's a participation by Jordan Peterson in a crime which falls under the notion of accessory. And one becomes an accessory after the fact by providing rhetorical cover for malefactors engaged in mass slaughter. Now, for, for me, my, my belief is, is that, you know, even when, the, when, when President Trump bragged about ordering a hit on Soleimani, yeah. the uh, Iranian general, okay, not a good person, not a friend of the United States, an enemy, but Soleimani was in the at the Baghdad airport going to a parley. He was going to a negotiation. 
to meet with the president or the prime minister of Iraq and and he was murdered at the airport by a by a drone strike or whatever it was and and see now to me that's evil right i'm not going to give in and you know what really shocked me this was my naivety about for my fellow americans every single american i knew maybe except for one or two people thought that was perfectly fine to kill an enemy on his way to a parley it, with mm -hmm. a with a drone strike I just, and by all the rules, the moral rules of war and the, and the just basic chivalry, basic knowledge of right and wrong, you got to be disgusted by an act like that. Yeah. I'm sorry, but and see, don't, people don't have a moral compass anymore. Yeah, they and just I don't, don't, and they pretend I, to have one. I, I always have a problem with gimmicky, gimmick-based ideologies, okay? So um, this is when, like, for example, this is when communists, uh, they, they try to, you know, they, they explain it very, in very simplistic terms. You know, it's about participation and sharing and not, not having a few people own everything. And it's like uh, everybody gets to decide things and everybody gets to have part of everything. And so they, they make it about this gimmick. But in reality, it's so much more complex than this. And so um, even somebody like Albert Einstein, uh, even somebody like Albert Einstein, uh, talked about communism and he sounded like a, a college student or or some somebody who has just gotten into mm -hmm. ideologies you know if you if you look if you look up albert einstein especially in connection with this stupid oppenheimer movie that's been showered with awards now um i talked about that movie um oppenheimer didn't like albert einstein and albert einstein was not allowed uh, anywhere near the manhattan project to make the nuclear bomb because einstein was a communist and if you listen to or re read einstein's words on communism it sounds like like a, a somebody some 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 kid who just got into polit into political ideologies it's it's just about mm -hmm. well lenin Len lenin was a great man because he tried all these good things and uh, uh, and Einstein said that um, what he called like anarchy, he called it something like anarchy capitalism. Like like there's no real rule, there's no real order. It's just winner takes all anarchy capitalism. That's the root of all evil. And if we get rid of that, then we can fix the entire world. I mean, even somebody with a high IQ can be terribly wrong about something if he's not really knowledge about that topic. I mean, this is the quintessential Dunning-Kruger effect. And and even uh, the Dunning-Kruger story, uh, uh, the Dunning-Kruger uh, study, they didn't even ask people about important topics. I mean, they figured out that people overestimate their abilities in, in areas they're not knowledge in. But if if you talk about, you know, hard-hitting topics, you know, security-related, religion-related, um, even more, even more people will overestimate themselves even more because that's just unfortunately how uh, how powerful these ideologies are. Um, and so I, I don't like this gimmicky stuff. And and also then you get radical libertarians and they say we can solve any question, we can solve any problem. It's just uh, by getting the government out of it. You know, just having everything private, that's going to fix everything. But but this is not the universal answer to everything. And I, I had no, radical, I, I debated radical libertarians and they told me, uh, well, if you conduct a war and you have a fully libertarian society, um, you know, some people would, uh, you know, band together, buy a tank and then set themselves a military goal and then they can make money with achieving that military goal. And I couldn't believe how little these people actually understood about war because they think they don't yeah. have to know about it. They don't have to be knowledge in all these topics because they have their magical gimmick and this magical gimmick is going to solve everything. Uh, and so I think this is the problem of Jordan Peterson. He thinks he's found the, the magic key, this magic key to unlock morality uh, and create a moral world and he can solve everything by applying this principle. But to me, it is warmed over Freemasonry. I mean, here's a quote. It says, uh, it says, mythological renditions of history, like those in the Bible, are just as true quote unquote true as the standard western empirical renditions just as liter literally true but how they are true is different western historians describe or think they describe what happened the traditions of mythology and religion describe the significance of what happened 
Okay, wait a minute. Um, so, w what is his definition of true then? Is is it useful? Is it when it's causing people to behave morally, then it's true to him? I mean, just you know, it, it gets into that kind of territory, and um, it's like it's like Freemasons. Freemasons will happily tell you they use allegories and and these old stories and you know, inspirations from the ancient world, um, and, and they use that to make a person better or make him perfect and, and turn him into a master mason, and, and he will then have a greater sense of morality and bring morals to the world. Um, well, that didn't course, work so uh, well in the British Empire. Yeah. Of course, philosophically, you know, if you go back to Plato, there's a, there's a realm where there, everything's perfect and it's perfectly ordered and organized. And you have this God who's the creator of all. Uh, that is the, the you know, uh, a, a speculation on what you would call the, what, be, what became the Christian God. Um, the, the God who was ultimately good, the God that, that created order. And mythology to some of these culture historians and stuff and psychologists, and I think what Jordan Peterson is saying is mythology reflects the divine order in its structures, right? And that that's how we're going to, and so he is saying, look, the Bible, and I think Peterson would say, you know, he did this thing on Genesis, the Bible is mythology, Peterson would say, and then it has the structures that give you morality. But then, and of course, then, of course, he's perfectly happy to say, oh, the monstrosity of the Holocaust and the Nazis. Mm. But yet when the Holocaust is, is a genocide, is ongoing against Ukraine, Peterson says nobody gives a damn about Ukraine. I mean, those are literally his words in that July 2022 uh, thing. Nobody gives a damn about Ukraine. Let's be honest. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Could you imagine him in yeah. 1943 saying, we shouldn't be sacrificing American lives fighting Germany? Nobody gives a damn about the Jews, right? Yeah. Or I mean, the and, Slavs. And also, and also I mean, um, J Jordan Peterson is not going as far as some of the others uh, that, that are popular influencers, uh, but it's close. Uh, and I want to mention briefly one comparison. Now, this is from this is from Alex Jones. Alex Jones uh, had explicitly said that um, the, the spirit of 1776 is in Russia. So Russia has Putin, they, they have that spirit of 1776. Now, um, the, you know, the, there, you, you, cannot, you cannot compare Vladimir Putin uh, to George Washington. Uh, it's more like there is a similarity between uh, a similarity between Vladimir Putin and King George the Third, right? Uh, that's that's a more more suitable uh, comparison. Now, American patri American patriots they will celebrate uh, they will celebrate Independence Day, but how much do people actually know what these Americans became independent of? What do they know about King George the Third and the British Empire? And, and what it could do to a colony. Now, for example, uh, the colony of India. You know, there's a study out, it's called uh, What the British Did to India by uh, Shashi Thoreau. And this is something that had things gone a bit differently, this is something that could have happened to, to America, uh, the American uh, colonies of Britain, destroying society like in India, destroying the economy and having it all very much under control. Uh, well, and having, Ireland. And have, yeah, and having everything, uh, starvation, uh, 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 intentional starvation, and having everything under surveillance. So if anybody wants to rebel, they would be grabbed and tortured for information. And, and this stuff that happened to India, and as you said, other places, this stuff could have happened to the American colonies um, without independence. So, uh, you know, it, it wasn't just King, uh, King George III, obviously, because the British Empire was... Uh, which British Empire was much more complex, but but still, this is what America became independent of. And nowadays, when Alex Jones talks about this stuff, or Jordan Peterson, or Jordan Peterson tries to uh, mix American patriotism, American conservatism, sort of conflate that with the Russians. I mean, to me, that's just insane because if, if you follow that line of argument as an American, you would need to burn your American flags, uh, burn your American uh, 
you know, birth certificate or passport or whatever, and you would have to pledge allegiance to King Charles of, uh, of Great Britain by, by that same logic, right? Because uh, Ukraine voted for independence, okay? Same term, they've, the Ukrainians voted for independence. Um, they had this document drafted in the 90s, and this document said the borders of Ukraine have to remain secure. This right now is Ukraine, including Crimea, including all the other stuff. This yeah, is Ukraine. The Budapest, man, man, it, and by the way, it it's can, true. It, that cannot, be, it cannot be violated. And, and the Russians yeah, agreed Ukraine, to that. The Russians yeah. agreed to that. The Russians agreed to it. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's um, it would have been far more respectable if Peterson had only said, I believe we should abandon Ukraine because nuclear war with Russia is not worth the risk. Then we could have a discussion on the merits of appeasement versus confrontation. Uh, but Peterson didn't do that. He said the West does not have the moral high ground in this conflict. And he said, we have no right to oppose Russian atrocities. He suggested that the West has morally contaminated Ukraine so that Russia has been forced to stem the pestilence, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, the, and he only made one faux pas from the Russian point of view. He, he, re, he didn't refer to the invasion as a special military operation. operation. So, it's a, <laughs> but, it, but everything else, he was on board with, and um, so, and, and Peterson says in this war, the West is being self-aggrandizing, a crime far, far worse than invading a neighboring country after declaring it's no country at all, then knocking down its silly cities, killing and kidnapping tens or hundreds of thousands of its people. I mean, Jordan Peterson, you are now a moral nullity. Yeah. I'm sorry. This is where he completely lost me. And see, the thing is, is that, that this is the difference when, when he quotes, I mean, Dostoevsky was a, was a kind of giant as a, as a writer. He quotes Dostoevsky. Solzhenitsyn was a kind of giant, even though at the end, when he was very old, he gave way to Putin and Putinism. Um, but but, but this, this thing that Peterson has done is so foul. In, in this large, biggest issue that we're confronting right now, that Europe is confronting, um, there's no, I don't think you can come back from it. I don't think that once you've gone there, you can't, I mean, we all make mistakes, I make mistakes, but that is that is a big one because you are becoming an accessory to mass murder when you do that. Yeah. Um, here it says, uh, Peterson, Peterson thinks that the solution to totalitarian horrors and spiritual sickness is the heroic individual. It says, the hero rejects identification with the group as the ideal of life, preferring to follow the dictates of his conscience and his heart. His identification with meaning and his refusal to sacrifice meaning for security renders existence acceptable uh, despite its, its tragedy. A society predicated upon belief in the paramount divinity of the individual allows personal interests to flourish and to serve as the power that opposes the tyranny of culture and the terror of nature. Wait, the, div the, the paramount divinity of the individual. Okay, um, so that sounds like the early Jung, uh, the early uh, conquest yeah. of Jung. Yeah. Uh, so uh, apparently Jordan Peterson has not moved beyond that, but it, it takes a lot more than conscience and heart. It takes knowledge about the empires, it takes knowledge about the intelligence world, and it takes the ability to look through this deception um, that is uh, so professionally done in this world. So, I mean, we can we can tell he wanted to be this hero himself, Peterson, when he opposed this this uh, gender speak, uh, uh, you know, this this thing at the universities, right? He wanted to be that kind of a uh, kind of a hero, but you know, this is just one topic. This was just one thing, and he rejects when, he re one thing that he was he got famous for. You know, but you know, and of course, he was very fortunate he didn't get destroyed. Um, Anna Polikovskaya, who, you know, was a Russian journalist who was brutally yeah. assassinated in 2006, shot in outside the lift by her apartment. Here's what she said about Putin shortly before her death. Probably one of the things she said that got her killed. Here's the quote. I dislike him, Putin, for a, the matter of factness, worse than felony of his cynicism for his lies, for the gas he used in the Nord Oath siege, for the massacre of the innocents that went on through his first term as president. And that was, she was murdered 
you know, almost 20 years ago now, 18 years ago, uh, a lady from the same generation as myself, she's the same age as me, if she were alive today. And you compare her stand on Putin yeah. versus Peterson's. Um, it's Politkovsky saw where Putin was taking Russia. She said, in Russia, we have had leaders with this outlook before. It led to tragedy, to bloodshed on a vast scale, to civil wars. Because I want no more of that, I just like this typical Soviet Czechist as he struts down the red carpet in the Kremlin on his way to the throne of Russia. Uh, you know, but Peterson, now that the ultimate catastrophe for the people of Eastern Europe has taken place because of this man, Putin. And it was foreseen by people like Polakowski. But Jordan Peterson says, oh, the West is culpable. The West is corrupt. Therefore, he gets to do it. He gets to murder all these people. Give him a pass. Yeah. Uh, and also, and also, I mean, the some of the marketing, the self marketing of the Putin regime, it, it's, it's somewhat, it's somewhat reminiscent. Of it. it reminds us of the, the Nazi, the Nazi self marketing, you know, when they, uh, when the Nazis laid down their argument for taking this territory and then taking some more territory because everybody's against us and we're always the victim. And, um, and uh, you know, this, this great idea of, a, of an empire that would last a thousand years and, um, you know, the, the, the Roman tradition they wanted to preserve. And also the Nazis talked a lot about um, degeneracy. Okay, so this is what, and in this marketing before everything you know went so went went downhill, um, this marketing this was attractive to many people. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, everybody was you know in, in the university, everybody was learning Latin, and everybody was into the Roman Empire, and uh, and then came this Nazi movement, and they promised everybody what they wanted to hear that this was going to be a revival of the roman system but not as degenerate as the medieval times because the nazis sort of implied that um the aristocracies in europe were uh had been doffed and weak and they lost their way and they became a bit too decadent and and so the nazi party was supposed to be a better roman empire and uh it was it was going to be based on race and um how much somebody contributes to the overall mission it was not about what family you were born to so this was the self marketing and um and they talked for, i mean for for a long for for uh about many many aspects of degeneracy uh you know just the the party scene in berlin um the you know corruption in uh in the business world uh socialist ideas that were floating around um and even you know nazis i mean the high the the high, highest level of the nazi party uh there were a lot of gay people a lot of gay men um but they wanted to keep that for the, keep that among themselves and and overall they were uh cracking down on, against the the you know the gay clubs and the the gay culture in germany at the time um so in the nazi self marketing they were seeing degeneracy everywhere and they were selling themselves as the cure and um and yet it, they were degenerate themselves and incredibly degenerate themselves. incredibly incredibly yeah. degenerate and it, and it um i mean and and it's now now it's like 2024 it's not 1924 we know a lot more about you know the uh the modern type crazy empires and and we know what to look out for we know how to study i mean I, when i was in university in 2006 right uh these professors would talk about um how russia was on a good way how things were going to work out and this is all going in a good direction and I was respectfully disagreeing, and and I said that I mean even though my my knowledge at the time was was far more limited, I just didn't see any genuine positive marker about the Russians. There was nothing in, positive. In two thousand six, the year that Anna Politkovsky and Alexander Litvinenko yeah. were both murdered. Yeah, yeah. You know, my that my professors my professors were still uh, pro Russia. Um, at a Catholic yeah. university, by the way, a Catholic university, by the way. Hmm. Um, that's uh, that's curious. Uh, you know, so I'm I'm curious. You know, I don't know you how much you've studied Peterson. Um, do you think? I mean, we're talking about Carl Jung's long, and it's a long and complicated story. Carl Jung was uh, attempting, really wanted. To, it was became a psychiatrist because he was interested in the soul. 
And do you think that that Peterson has, and I, I think um, if you look at the whole of Jung's work, he was learning, he was evolving, he did develop some understanding of the soul. And in his last book, one of his last books, The Undiscovered Self, he said that our modern politics is making us insane because we've dispensed with religion and that self-reflection about our own sin, our own uh, failings. And, and we are just projecting our shadow. We're saying all the evil is over there, whether it's on the Iranians or the Russians, you know, and there is evil there, but there's also evil in us, right? Evil cuts through the middle of every human heart. And, and I think that, um, that this is, this is what we have to always keep. We have to try to keep ourselves honest. And, um, we, we have to, if we're going to make the world better, it has to start with each individual person thinking about, well, what is right and wrong? What is morality? What is reality? And looking into the soul. So do you, this is the thing that amazes me. So when we look at Peterson, who is associated, he talks about Jung a lot. Is Peterson as diligent as Jung? Is he, has he really learned? Or is, is he just a celebrity who we can't take seriously, who has some insights and some intelligence, but who is ultimately misleading the people who he's advising? Um, I, think, I think there are some uh, some hidden clues or more or less uh, there's some clues that that I think we can interpret uh, to to get a better picture of, of, of the, the actual Jordan Peterson uh, one of the one of the clues uh, or that is actually a double clue it's about his his two books uh, the first one as I mentioned maps of meaning in 1999 um, it took him 13 years to complete and the other one uh, the book was called 12 Rules for Life. It came out in 2018. So it's almost 20 years later. So it takes him 13 years to write a book and it takes him almost 20 years uh, to write another. And I think that I don't, I don't personally, I don't, I don't know which, which book I find worse, Maps of Meaning or 12 Rules for Life. Um, but um, it, it, it basically, it, it does show us, it, it shows me something. And when I look at his video lectures, um, it seems it seems a bit it seems superficial. I think he's only good, and he can only work reasonably fast in a in a in a, in a specific topic, which is his core topic. You know, when he's uh, researching the, the the psychology of addiction, for example. I think this is the only. I mean, field. I mean, let me just ask a question. If you've read those books, he's claiming that people construct their own meaning; that meaning isn't given. Um, well, he's, he's intentionally vague. I mean, he, uh, he's intentionally vague about this. I mean, he talks about Gnostic, he talks about Gnostic, uh, concepts, but then he, you know, he's, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be too explicit. I mean, uh, but, um, he's, he's, he's giving you Freemasonry essentially. And, uh, and, and that's very, very old school and it's very, outdated and and so i see this in his whole body of work besides his core issue when it's about his core issue he can work fast enough and he can get results but outside of that core field that he worked in outside of that field he seems awfully slow uh to me and derivative so he has i think he has big problems um just handling these other topics and and working with these other topics and combining these other topics uh, and and uh, it's just if if he writes two books in what is it uh, thirty three thirty two years he makes he he can he he wrote two books in th more than thirty years um, and when I look at his video and, lectures and he's primarily a scholar I mean he's paid yeah, to and, be a scholar yeah and when when I look at his lectures and when I look at what he says about Ukraine it's always very superficial it's something that you could pick up on. By reading, you know, a think tank paper here, a newspaper article there, just some very superficial research, and then you can just pu put that together and have a presentation. Uh, it's it seems like a lot of bluffing to me because I mean I can find g really good literature uh, in many different areas, you know, uh, and 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 there's always something unique and there's always something special, but I I. Uh, it's. It seems like he's. He's just not that kind of guy. He's not the guy he wants to be. Uh, and uh, it's. 
when when he talks i mean when he talks about these 12 rules for life it almost seems like he's he's condescending towards his audience because he thinks himself he thinks he, he himself is really really smart and he thinks that other people are not smart so he's giving people what he thinks they need to behave you know he wants stability in society uh so and and i think on some degree on some level these mythologies and these hero stories uh and, and to some degree christianity for him is just it's just tools it's just tools for the average person out there for the people he thinks of as stupid and uh and he wants these people to behave and you know so give them give them what they what they need um but he himself i think is more interested in in you know the early jungian uh topics you know the the mysteries and and i think that's how so you, you think he just so you think he is i mean i've never heard him really he uses he talks about myths and he talks about the unconscious so and he's using a Jungian categories in a lot of uh, areas, but he, he doesn't seem to use them very precisely. He's got his own. It seems to me that uh, Peterson has his own uh, dynamic of uh, talking about women and men, and and he couches it. He's very careful not to cross certain, actually some politically correct lines. Um, so he's not, people, traditionalists and Christians seem to like him, but he and he defends some of their stuff but he really isn't a traditionalist or a conservative is he um yeah well i mean it's i th i th he he probably believes he is all that because he's aligning himself with russia when in at a time when russia is um when russia is self marketing as the third rome you know, just, just going back to this idealistic view that I talked about uh, in, in Germany and Switzerland when uh, Carl Gustav Jung was alive. You know, this, this exaggerated, romanticized idea of ancient Greece as this perfect, serene society. And, and there were geniuses everywhere. And, you know, a genius was also a warrior and, and, and everything was so perfect. And then this perfect empire was then spoiled. Um, and and it got lost, so we have to regain it. I think um, Jordan Peterson is still about that old idea of regaining um, this old paradise type system. And and I think that he is willing, and that's my personal uh, my personal belief. I think that Peterson Peterson is willing to uh, sacrifice Ukraine for that greater goal. Uh, he's willing to accept the the, the victims in order to get closer to that that new rome or that new greece where uh you know everything is safe and everybody is smart and and everybody's just like jordan peterson views himself i think he is uh hmm. i think because i think ultimately he thinks that the evil forces you know the left and you know the woke crowd and whatever he thinks it's going to be grim anyway there's going to be conflict anyway so he's just siding with the the empire he thinks is compatible with his Jungian ancient beliefs. You know, this this romanticized yeah. Uh, view. Yeah, which is interesting. You know, it's kind of like the Dugan pose. That Dugan, Dugan and, and I'm going to be writing a piece about uh, Charles Upton's book uh, about Dugan because there's a lot more. I mean, it's a thick book, and I, I should uh, just show it to people because it is really fascinating. Um, and and uh, and to talk about uh, Upton is is a very sophisticated, philosophically sophisticated guy. This is Dugan against Dugan, right? By Charles Upton, um, the, a traditionalist critique of the fourth political theory, and of course the fourth political theory has some, you know, very scary stuff in it um, and, and that anticipates a lot of this um, gender transgenderism, which which I think leads to transhumanism is what I argued in my article this week is that uh, you're on a you're on a trajectory you're on a path and any time you do anything you are setting up um, a direction a kind of motion in a direction and th and that's what what troubles me about um, you know Tucker Carlson going in actually meeting Dugan in Moscow when he interviewed Putin and with um, um, 
you know, some of Trump's guys uh, meeting with Dugan, uh, like Steve Bannon, uh, who had a meeting with Dugan in, uh, in Rome in November of 2018. Um, uh, and, and the thing is, is that, that, that there is, okay, I'm not a narrow-minded person, you can learn from all kinds of people. It's like, I, I don't care if my auto mechanic is, is a Muslim or is a, uh, worships trees or something. If he's a good auto mechanic, you can learn. There's all kinds of subjects you, you can learn from people, even though they may disagree with your, your theology or your, your personal beliefs. But, but there is a, a moment here where you, there are these moral truths. There is truth with a capital T that if people are basically participating in a lie, which again, excuses mass murder or killing people, that is to me, that's like, that is where the structure of morality is absolute, right? And, and of course, that's why you have to be so careful when you engage in warfare or you engage in policies that can cause life to be lost, this is a huge, massive burden, you know, a burden that, for example, President Lincoln in the Civil War felt that, that, that proper, decent people feel when they're involved with it. Um, but I, I don't, when somebody cavalierly says, like Jordan Peterson, nobody gives a damn about Ukraine, yeah. you know, it, it, to me it gives him away as not being authentic, not being true. And, and it's the same thing with Dugan. When he goes through, America must be destroyed. He talks about actually destroying America all the time. Then he comes over and he sits with Alex Jones and he talks about how he loves Americans, right? Traditionalist yeah. America. You're really yeah. traditionalist. I just hate your government. You know, then you just see through. There's an insincerity. There's a betrayal of the truth in the service of murder, of mass murder, that is undeniable at some level. Yeah, And, and, also, and that, that's the difference to me in between someone yeah, I mean, who's really... If, if, kind somebody, of and not. if somebody uh, becomes famous to the degree that we've seen with Jordan Peterson, I mean, it's a, any mistake that he makes, any false thing that he preaches to his audience uh, becomes more dangerous. You know, the bigger your audience, you know, the bigger your mistake is going to have an effect. Um, and I think that um, there's so many mistakes uh, dangerous mistakes here. I mean, we talked about this in an earlier show about, you know, Dugin and the Russian occultists. Um, you know, this this idea that also that is also promoted somewhat by Jordan Peterson, this idea that you can just, as a right-winger uh, in America, as a conservative, as a Christian, that you could just take psychedelic drugs and you go out in nature and you, you disengage from the modern world and you just uh, embrace nature and the, and the mysterious. And also, this is something that people have experienced all over the world when they take uh, psychedelics. There are different psychedelic plants, uh, all kinds of plants, and it's usually the same group of, uh, of, of, of alkaloids, right? So you take ayahuasca in, in, in some... Uh, you know, Latin American bush, or you take uh, uh, a certain type of cactus, or it's it, you smoke a certain type of um, uh, what is it? Uh, what do they call it? Um, yeah, there's 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 different types of fungus. I mean, there's some there's some plants over here in Germany. Um, they are decorative plants, and if you actually dry them and smoke them, you would have uh, a really really extreme. Uh, trip and uh, people use that for decoration and, uh, and then of course people remember that you can actually smoke these plants um, so this is something that that has been done all over the world especially it's been done in the mystery cults and sometimes people have similar types of experiences and they believe they are in contact with beings now an experience like that can have profound um repercussions for that person um, that person can be more uh, vulnerable to certain types of propaganda and they can also get deeper into get deeper into a cult system and what's typical for a, a cult system or mystery cult system they can warp your definitions of morality uh, so they will at the beginning they will 
present to you a classic type morality. This is something that Jordan Peterson talks about in public. You know, it's very simple, cut and dry. You know, the hero goes against the bad guys, even though it's dangerous. Um, but the deeper you get into this stuff, um, especially when it's tied to the empires, um, the more your sense of morality can become warped and it can become defective. Now, some cultures, they have actually... They, they have sort of given up on fighting evil. This is when certain cultures say there has to be a balance of good and bad. So there's like, it's, it's, we cannot change it and it's always going to be like that. So it's almost like the world runs on autopilot. Uh, so you have to accept evil, uh, try to counterbalance it somewhat and just hope for the best. Um, and so there's all these different type of concepts when it comes to evil. Um, and uh, when Jordan Peterson is is preaching this stuff, uh, this can have some pretty serious serious consequences. I think I don't even think that Peterson is aware of all the consequences uh, this might have because apparently young people are listening to him. So it's like these 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 uh, teenagers and people in their early twenties, they're listening to they're listening to Jordan Peterson and they uh, and they want to shape their lives. Uh, according to his uh, woozy message. And and then they just start repeating what Jordan Peterson says about the Russians, right? And, and uh, I mean, this is something that Peterson should be able to to recognize for what it is. I mean, I mean, if, if he's as intelligent as he claims he is, and if, if he's always been interested in the topic of evil in the empires, he should be able to look through the Russian propaganda, what the Russian system really is, um, and uh, and how dangerous it is. I mean, this is something that that I would expect him to be able to do, but yeah. either he's not able yeah. to do it or he's not willing to do it for some strange reason. And and of course, well, when you it, talk about it, is, it, it is because I think he has become, in a sense, uh, attached to a political cause uh, on the right. And somebody, somebody who is elevated, who is promoted by people, ends up being attached to these interests. And I think these interests are unwilling. For, for Peterson to be promoting the idea that Russia is our ally against Tibet counterbalance China is to show that he hasn't understood the essential evil in Beijing and Moscow, that, that, that they are determined to destroy the West and the United States and to dominate the world. And that they realize they have to do it together because each one of them can't do it on their own. And he hasn't grasped that because, and this is my experience, you know, I wrote, when I wrote Origins of the Fourth World War, it was a shattering experience to confront the evil of totalitarianism, which I think is what Peterson talks about confronting. But he's not really shattered by it because he, st he evidently didn't really see it. Because it really is a world-destroying, I mean, when Carl Jung wrote his historical book, The Aeon, okay, there's, you know, whatever um, heresies he promotes, he's examining the book of Revelation, he's examining prophecies about the future, he's looking as a psychologist with all of his empirical background, and he says, Antichrist is real. He says in this book, he says, look, he defines Antichrist. It's someone who promises the same thing as Christ promised and delivers the exact opposite. And he said, communism, Mark, Marxist Leninism is the concentrated form of the Antichrist movement in history. He says this in this book. And this book is, you know, Anne is incredibly fascinating. You, there's things to disagree with him, but there's insights, powerful insights about evil. And he says in this book that Evil is something that when you do look at it, you are shattered by it, if you're really looking at it, because it's something that, again, we're all, we all can be subject to, evil. And, and for to speak about, and, and again, I go to Verglund's definitions of evil. And Verglund, again, people will say, ah, oh, Verglund's not really a Christian. I've had people say that. Of course, Verglund is defending Christianity the way Jung did at the end of his life. Okay. Maybe imperfectly, maybe he's not a Christian, okay, but he is really defending it and saying, oh my gosh, this is what we have left to defend ourselves with. Um, and we are facing a kind of 
a, ho a holocaust, a, a mass genocide, uh, and and you can see it. It's logically entailed in the struck in their totalitarian structures of thought, in the characters of Marx and Lenin and all of these folks, and in all of their followers, they're all the mi little microcosms of this evil, even though they may even seem like very benign people, and and some of them are, but it, it they're reflecting something that's evil without recognizing it. And this is the thing we have to come to terms with. Unless we can develop that uh, discernment to be able to see it, how can we fight it? We don't even, we can't even recognize our enemy. And if Jordan Peterson, the famous psychologist, can't recognize real evil and stand against it when it's wiping out a country right in front of our eyes. I I don't know. It's it's horrifying to think. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there's something about uh, yeah. There's there's some quotes when he uh, uh, he was Jordan Peterson was asked about about religion and. Uh, uh, he was uh, in a 2017 interview. Peterson was asked if he was a Christian. He responded, "I suppose the most straightforward answer to that is yes." When asked if he believes in God, Peterson responded, "I think the proper response to that is no, but I'm afraid he might exist." In a podcast with Douglas Murray and Jonathan no. Pago, Peterson stated that God is the ultimate fictional character, which is at the top of the hierarchy of attention and action. Um, yeah, and then uh, writing for The Spectator, Tim Lott said, Peterson draws inspiration from the Jungian interpretation of religion uh, and holds similar views to the Christian existentialism of Søren Kierkegaard and Paul Tillich. So, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like um, you know, that, that Christianity for him, Christianity for him is just another traditional type myth. It's a, it's a template to him. It's like uh, something that has been done in multiple versions around the world. And, uh, you know, this is just Christianity is just one example of this template and everybody's into the same templates. This is kind of the old Jung, right? This is the, the early, the early Jung that, that said that, you know, the mystery calls, that's well, where you know, it's at. Jung, when he was asked, you know, in his old age, uh, there's a famous BBC documentary interview with Jung. And he was asked, do you believe in God? He said, no, I don't have to believe in God because I know God is real, is what Jung said, which is really interesting. If Peterson said that God is a, what, he didn't believe in God? He thought God was a mythical fictional, character? Fictional character. Yeah. Fic fictional, fictional, that's different than mythical, right? <laughs> that's even lower down the scale. Myth, myth isn't actually just simply fiction, but... Um, my goodness, I didn't know he'd made that statement. Um, you know, I, I should make a comment about uh, German scholarship and uh, and Christianity going back. You know, both uh, Nietzsche and Marx had the same were influenced by the same uh, teacher. Uh, you know, and and Nietzsche was a philologist, and of course Marx was studying philosophy which involved, you know, knowing ancient languages. Um, and th some of these German, this was something peculiar to German academics. They, when they would learn the ancient Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and so on, they would lose their faith. Um, because the, usually the brand of Protestantism, and I think it's usually Protestants, uh, that they believed in, um, they discovered certain things in the actual reading in the original language, which was not what they had been led to believe when they were younger. So they had this experience of um, uh, losing their faith. Nietzsche very famously went from being a very devout Christian to all of a sudden just not accepting it at all. And Marx had the same thing. Marx was raised a Christian, by the way. He wasn't raised in a synagogue. Um, and so they, they had, they lost their faith. This, we find this in German academics, um, German language academics, uh, Carl Jung was Swiss, but he was in the German language. We find this, um, in, in, in almost all of them, whether it's Carl Jaspers or, um, Eric Berglund, they're not Christians in the sense that ordinary people are because they've been exposed to Greek philosophy. They've been exposed to um, ancient languages. They've read the Old Testament in the original Hebrew. They've, so they, 
have come to understand that it's all more, there's a lot more to it. It's more complicated. Um, and you have people like Berglund who want to preserve Christianity, even though their understanding of it is different from your average person. And people like Carl Jung who come back and say, oh no, we need this. We can't, there's no, there is no road back to this pagan Greek world, uh, demonic world. Um, but the, the problem is, is that, uh, so people have to understand there are powerful insights in these writers for understanding our political dilemma, the civilization, the crisis of modernity, right? To understanding it, these guys have important insights and we need all the insights we can get. And Peterson has some insights too, but the minute they go over to the enemy of Western civilization of and of right and wrong, then we have to call them out, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, fr um, when I commented on this this video that Peterson had done on on the Ukraine war, uh, this almost one hour video. Um, he uh, uh, yeah he's he's talks he talks about Ukraine and then he just switches over uh, to to speaking about the the degeneracy of the West um, and uh, and so he's um, he's 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 creating this he's creating sort of this this argument not explicitly but um, underneath underneath the surface he. As far as I can, as, as far as I can tell, he's trying to uh, he's trying to tell the audience that maybe this is a just war uh, that that the Russians are the Russians are waging in Ukraine because um, he does insinuate this this argument we've heard so many times before that NATO NATO was closing in against Russia and all that nonsense uh, and so. Um, Underneath the surface, it almost sounds as if he's trying to say, this is a just war. Putin is that mythological hero. This 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 archetype hero that Jordan Peterson was writing about and that Jung was writing about, Putin is doing a thing that is unpopular and dangerous, but Putin is doing it because it's right. I'm, I'm not 100% sure if, if that's what Jordan Peterson is trying to say, but I think it's a very strong possibility. He, Peterson maybe, not, maybe doesn't want, want to say it outright because that would get him canceled or that just it's bad for business, but it's well, almost he, he like... He basically does say that. He, I mean, yeah. it's basically what he says. The West is degenerate and um, you know Putin may be a bad guy, may be a rough character, um, but the West is worse. And therefore, what Mr. Putin wants to do has some justice and has some rightness to it, right? I mean, that's ultimately when you f get done with all the fudging, you know, you make qualifying statements that really contradict your main statement. And that's, that's how you, it's called hedging, right? So well, I didn't really say that, I, then you can go back and quote yourself as saying the opposite when you're accused. I mean, scholars are famous for doing this. They, that's why their writings, many scholarly, second-rate scholarly writings are so horrible to read. Because before they say anything, they have all these things where they say, I'm not going to really say this, and then they say it, right? So that they can't, they can't be found in any error. Because they're anticipating that there's something wrong with what they're saying. And and that's what he does because that's what he was. He was a scholar. He taught at Harvard. He was at uh, what uh, the University of Toronto. So you know, it's just bad. It's not forthright, and it's very disappointing. And uh, I should say, you know, a lot of what I when I first heard Jordan Peterson, I thought of this book. It was a very good little book, uh, <laughs> William Hooven. Yeah, it's. I think it's. Uh, it's probably Jordan Peterson's sheet sheet. It's. It's a very good little book. I found this in the 1980s in a in a bookstore in a mall that I used to hang out at and and just read the books. I couldn't afford everything I wanted to read, so I I'd, I'd read a book in the in the bookstore and then I'd take one home. <laughs> so, but Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Kafka by William Hubin. And this is a little gem, by the way. This is a really great little book about these four guys. And it's, uh, the original title was, I think it called it The Four Horsemen. I, 
I somehow my old copy got so shredded, you know, it's just a paperback. I ordered a new one a few years ago, so I'd have a fresh copy around here. But it's it's really great little mini history uh, uh, analysis of these four guys, Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Kafka, showing how these guys all had this uh, rather apocalyptic vision of the future of our civilization and what was wrong with it and what was wrong with our, you know, the decline. And of course, Hubin is a Christian. Um, so he's writing from uh, this from a Christian point of view. But it's um, it's a beautiful little book. And I it seems to me that, that Peterson is, I thought the first time I heard him, I thought, oh, he sounds just like Hubin, but not quite, right? Peterson's got his own modern psychological twist on it. So I just thought I'd uh, mention that. Yeah, and here's something about here's something about that uh, that uh, addiction episode, and I, I also I also think that Peterson wants to frame himself as a a martyr-like figure, almost a Jesus-like figure, because he views himself as as this great hero, you know, working against the dark forces. And of course, every great hero in these old stories, every great hero must suffer. You know, he needs to go go through hell uh, and 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 have and experience all this pain and come out on the other end. Uh, and so, it says uh, uh, Peterson spent eight days in a medically induced coma at an unnamed clinic in Russia. Uh, Peterson's daughter posted a video claiming that she and her father had traveled to Russia seeking an unorthodox treatment for his physical dependence on the drug clonazepam. Uh, and um, according to Michaela, he nearly died several times during his medical ordeal. After weeks in intensive care, he was unable to speak or write and was taking anti-seizure medicine. So it's almost like he rose from the dead. I think that's this is what they're alluding to. He uh, he basically al died or almost died multiple times. He was not functioning. And, and what and was he it again? He was addicted to. What was uh, he addicted to? Clonazepam. That's I think that's a benzodiazepine. That's a very heavy tranquilizer. Um, this is the kind of stuff that my my father was prescribed uh, for decades. And um, is that an opiate or is that a? Is, it's a psych medicine, isn't it's, it? It's uh no, it's it's a it's a it's a tranquilizer. Hang on a second, tranquilizer. let me just okay. uh let me just um, clonazepam is a benzodiazepine drug used for the acute treatment of panic disorder, epilepsy, and non-convulsive status epilepticus. Uh, and uh, and why was he taking it? He says, and I can't, I, we cannot really verify this. He says that um he was on it uh prescription uh it was on the prescription because his wife had cancer and so in order to unwind he had been sleep, on it before his wife's cancer he'd been on these things for years hadn't he well I think. it's it's well the way he tells the story is that his his wife his wife had cancer um and uh uh hang on here's the detail and um uh, yeah, it was an I've heard that it was, story about his, but I, but I think he, it was just an a, 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 an a, an increase of uh, something he was already on. I think. Well, it says that, it says that his his dosage was increased when his his wife had more trouble with cancer, and and then he had these problems on it, and he tried to come off, and he couldn't come off uh, this this dosage that he was on. Now. We we're supposed to just believe everything he says about that, but you know, there's so many other possibilities. He might have just taken that uh, recreationally. Uh, he might have taken that just to unwind, you know, because he's a busy man. Um, I mean, we're supposed to believe that this was out of grief and stress because of his wife, but um, there may be more reasons why he would have sought. Um, such a a prescription, and we also I don't know the exact dosage he was on because um, the stuff is dangerous. It's very addictive, but um, I there are many people on these, and there are many people who go through a detox or some sort of rehab. What are, Why what are is the this withdrawal case special? side effects? What 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 is it, the um, side effects that it was so dangerous he had to go to Russia? Do you remember? Well, basically, uh, well it, it's this stuff works on the central nervous system. It it really Un, it really uh, brings down your system, and it's a state of bliss. It's exactly what he advised his followers against: um, 
to take a drug that would cause this artificial bliss. So you don't care about the problems uh, that you have anymore and you can sleep and you feel like a baby. This is why my father took this stuff. Um, and my father actually pretended he had a heart problem. So he, he basically had these panic attacks and he, uh, he told people he had a heart problem and his medication was for his heart, but it was really just the state of panic and, and discomfort. And uh, he got his prescription for, for some strange reason, because that was the only thing mm -hmm. that would make him sleep and calm down. Uh, so I'm, I don't trust, I mean, th there's like this old saying in medical circles, never trust an addict, because you shouldn't trust an addict or former addict to tell the truth. Uh, and so we should be careful when he talks about this stuff. Because he blames it on outside factors, you know, the, the cancer of his wife. And then for some ma magical reason, he had this huge problem on his prescribed dosage. And then his withdrawal basically killed him multiple times and he needed to go to a special clinic. And his ordeal was special and his suffering was special. Everything about it was special, he said. And I, I, I have a problem with that story. I mean, there's something does not... Does not really well, you got to you have a very in, influential conservative who's got this trouble, and the Russians somehow get their hands on him physically. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting to me. And he comes back from that experience, and he's suddenly ready to give Russia a pass on invading a neighboring country. It, it's interesting to me. I oh, mean, here's it's, something. It's, oh, here, here's some. Here's some. Okay, this this even gets stranger. Um, it says here, Peterson's health problems first surfaced in September of 2019 when his family announced that he had undergone a stint in rehab in upstate New York. According to Michaela's update from Russia, that's his daughter, he was prescribed the sedative clonazepam, a benzodiazepine, by his family doctor in 2017 for anxiety stemming from a severe autoimmune reaction to food. Right. And, and, and then he gets on this, what do you call lion diet, this ho only meat diet? Eating. Well, now I can tell you that I had, uh, I got, I poisoned myself, probably what happened, I uh, poisoned myself remodeling my house 10 years ago. I was exposed, I think it was this floor glue because I developed uh, autoimmune Graves disease after being exposed to the floor glue. It came on afterwards. And of course, I think that, uh, and what I was told later by a doctor is that my mast cells uh, were mutated, which meant that then they would go and attack my own body. And it was all kinds of foods would set it off. So I wasn't quite on an all meat diet, but I was eating, uh, I was, I went paleo, right? I could not eat yeah. carbs for about eight years. And then the doctor said, you know what, you're lucky, you, it looks like your mast cells uh, died off the mutated ones and your new ones are not mutated. So I was lucky I could, you know, you can be stuck with these autoimmune disease, but when you've taken chemicals or you're exposed to chemicals and I, I have no idea if it, his daughter seems to have it and he has it, maybe they were exposed to something that caused mutations in their immune system because they both, both him and his daughter have severe uh, food allergies or autoimmune issues mm. with food to where the only thing they can eat is beef, which is very odd. And, and I think that, that his wife has something similar. She's eating maybe chicken. I, I may be misremembering mm. there, but yeah. um, th 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 that's a very serious, but you know, for those of a, us that have but been he's exposed not, he's, to that, that's a but he, he's thing. not, he's not your regular guy. I mean, he's supposed to be an expert on addiction. So, when he feels anxiety from food, for, then he uh, he gets a prescription for he medicates himself. Yeah, he gets a prescription for a for a, uh, a a benzodiazepine, and then a toxic. By the way, benzodiazepine is a toxic medicine. It's toxic yeah. to the liver. And then he tries. So he tried to help you really. Then he tried to quit the medication cold turkey during the summer of 2019. Why would he do that when he can read the description of this stuff? When he's supposed to be an expert on this stuff, you don't you win yourself off of it? Yeah, you shouldn't quit cold yeah. turkey. What was he thinking? Or maybe the story isn't even true. Uh, it says that Michaela has consistently and emphatically claimed that her father is suffering strictly from physical dependence and not from addiction. And uh, What's they stress. The difference? Well, 
not there. It's not <laughs> What's the that, difference well, between addiction and they construe dependence? one. They certainly construe a difference. They said dependence simply means that a person gets withdrawal symptoms when they stop taking a drug. Uh, but the National Institute on Drug Abuse defines addiction as compulsive use despite harmful consequences. It is possible to be dependent on a drug without being addicted to it. Well, it's just it's just splitting hairs, you know. It's just like word games at this point. Um, he had a problem. He had anxiety, um, and he got on benzos instead of finding another solution. He 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 just went on benzos. He increased the dosage. Uh, and then he tried to go cold turkey and that didn't work. So, and then he needed a special clinic in Russia with a special method that's not disclosed mm -hmm. to get him off of it. I mean, what kind of story is that? I mean, is it, is he, is he that narcissistic that he can't just tell a simple story? I got addicted to the stuff. Um, I, I wanted to keep it a secret. Um, it is somewhat embarrassing because of my statements about about drugs, uh, but um, yeah, I I did some rehab and now I'm off it. Why can't he tell a normal story? Why does it have to be this epic martyr? I almost died. I go, I went through hell. I'm this big hero story. Why does he have to tell a story like this? Um. So. This is just this is just strange to me, um, and so he and then he claims, of course, no, he was not an addict. He was he was too good and too strong to be an addict. He just had a physical dependency on that. Uh, yeah, so uh, benzos can cause physical dependence within four weeks. So they tell us he got on it in 2017, and then. Uh, and then he went to rehab in 2019. That's two years later. And he tried to quit cold turkey in 2019. So, yeah, we know it's it's creating an addiction in, in four weeks. And he took it for, what, two years? It's like hmm. uh, something doesn't quite add up with this story. Um and, uh, and then it says the state-of-the-art treatment for... In this article here, the state-of-the-art treatment for benzodiazepine dependence is not some grueling ordeal. Patients are not strapped to a hospital bed, white-knuckling it through withdrawal. Instead, they are gradually weaned off the drugs outside the hospital over the course of months. In general, doctors try to decrease a patient's dose by 25% every two weeks. High success rate, up to 80-90% 80, of patients have successfully completed detox in these clinics. Um, but Jordan Peterson, he tried to quit cold turkey. Uh, what's going on? And, uh, yeah, I don't understand. and of course, yeah. and, and of course his daughter says, um, his daughter says that, um, yeah, he, he had some paradoxical special reactions to this drug. Uh, you know, just, just this restlessness and whatnot. Um, Michaela told RT, that's Russia Today, the station that can no longer broadcast in the West. Uh, Michaela told RT that her father was looking for a place that had the guts to detox him cold turkey, a place where doctors aren't influenced by the pharmaceutical companies. What? <laughs> so, so, I mean... It, Western doctors, they can get you off of this stuff and it's a, it's a successful process and it's not magic. You just wean these people off and you monitor them. But, but they go to Russia because they have some special magic going on. I mean, wh what is that supposed to mean? Well, you know, it's interesting. In, in Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, Rule 6 is set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Oh, okay. Um, the West is decadent. It's awful. You should let Russia overrun things. But I went to Russia to be cured of my addiction, and I almost died. Where's the? It's yeah, yeah. Oh boy, I yeah. I don't know. But but you know the thing is, I I think uh, it's it's kind of unfair reflection on Carl Jung that that Jordan Peterson quotes him. Um, that may be the unfair thing about all this. Um, 
Uh, and I know, you know, that it is, I'm not, uh, I'm not done with, um, with this fascinating book by, uh, by Richard Knoll, but um, Peterson's, uh, Peterson's use of Jung, maybe like his use of other things, is sort of a pop psychology use, hey, rather than a pop psychology usage. What is right? that? Well, that is, there's the popularizers, there, there's the popularizers, the popularizing right, right, of right. It's something it's that's a, serious. It's a trend, yeah. It's, it's, in other words, you're really not understanding Jung or Dostoevsky or Solzhenitsyn when you get the Jordan Peterson short version. And I've, I've listened to Jordan Peterson's short versions before and thought, well, that's not really it. Um, the, you, you actually ought to read those writers. You ought to read Crime and Punishment. You ought to read the, read the Devils, or sometimes tr translated as the possessed. Um, you ought to read um, Aeon, or if you were able to read something that difficult, or at least The Undiscovered Self by Jung. Everybody should read some of these works because they're, they are important for our understanding ourselves, uh, whether you agree entirely with them or not. Um, the reason, same reason to read Nietzsche or, or to read Karl Marx or even Hitler. You, you need to understand these people and these things and these times. Um, and, but, but a popularizer, and, and I'm guilty of this, I'm a popularizer. I'm writing for people that, um, that aren't reading those books. Uh, but, but Peterson is thought to be on this really high level. Um, and, and that is a, that is a problem. Um, yeah. And he, you know. I mean, he wanted to be, I mean, he wanted to be the new symbol of the symbol of, uh, masculinity, or he wanted to celebrate, uh, celebrate masculinity. And he made a big point about that. But when you read his, uh, his 12 rules for life, I mean, he talks about having been a wimp when he was younger. I mean, he, he talks about some of these encounters and, and of course, when he, when it came out that he was, he was on benzodiazepines and, uh, and he, he, he messed up his, his, uh, you know, his, his rehab strategy and whatnot, it, it, none of it seemed very masculine. And it's something that, um, when, it, you know, at some point when you, when you want to claim that topic, when you want to talk about masculinity in the West and strength in the West, um, you either have to have a good grasp, a very good grasp of the concept, or you need to, um, you need to live that in some in so, in some way that is more than just virtue signaling. I mean, people talk about the left virtue signaling. They talk about virtues and they they uh, festoon themselves with these slogans, but but it's it's really hard to measure up to these. Uh, these standards, right? It's, just, it's easy to talk about morals. It's easy to talk about strength, but it's difficult to come up with that strength day by day by day by day. You know, without some form of cheating or some form of you know medication or self medication. Um, and uh, you know, this is sort of a, a big topic, not just with Jordan Peterson, but with many others. I mean, especially those guys who are pro Russia. They associate now masculinity itself with Russia. And and uh, and and everything that comes that comes with it. So if you want to be strong and masculine, you got to be with this whole program. But if you oppose Russia, uh, you are one of the. If you if you really oppose Russia, you're one of these Democrats. You're one of the woke people. You're one of those weak people who are degenerates and who ruin everything. Um, but um, I mean, does does the life does the life of Jordan Peterson uh, seem very masculine to you? I mean, it's like, um, I'm not impressed by his political work at all. Uh, and so when I look at something else, when I look at other things, um, I don't I don't see that that he he's he's I, I see a problem with him claiming claiming the topic of masculinity and then associating that with Russia essentially you know it's almost it's almost like the communists who claimed whole concepts uh, like uh, justice or um, uh, you know just just um, 
fairness, justice. They want to claim terms and they want to claim entire concepts uh, that we're talking about as if they own them and they are the only ones who can define them. And uh, it's it's almost like like uh, Peterson is using the leftist playbook, and it's also like a right wing version of of the left wing uh, critical theory, is it not? I mean, what in these these the, I mean, critical theory we talked about this, it's it's just a form of subversion. You're trying to subvert a society by using specific ways of complaining, whining being provocative publicity stunts. And it seems like the entire new right wing, the pro-Russian new right wing, um, is using sort of uh, their own adapted version of, of left wing critical theory. Okay, it seems like I lost your audio signal. Yeah, I was just okay. muted for a second. It, it, it seems like we're in this era where we have comedians doing political commentary, right? And we see this all over the place. Uh, this is this is the kind of thing that that is not very good, um, and and so uh, it's all about the popular people, the jazzy people, the entertainers doing the commentary. So how serious is that commentary, where people are just entertained? Not very serious, I don't think. And so in a way, you could say that Peterson and all these people who become super famous. They've done it by being entertainers. And so what is the, um, how serious are they? That's the, the other question. And I think maybe the audience, you know, Marshall McLuhan, the message is, the medium is the message. And um, Neil Postman with Amusing Ourselves to Death, we are no longer a literate society. It's not about reading. It's not about studying. It's not about knowing things. It's about presentation. Right, it's it's about saying things that grab people in the immediate moment, and um, maybe maybe the truth is a little bit boring and prosaic, maybe too prosaic now to even compete. Maybe that's the the actual situation we're in. Yeah, but people, I mean, uh, people felt, uh, for example, um, in in, in late Tsarist Russia, people felt powerless they they felt they were very they were very frustrated and they felt powerless and here came communism you know promising them a brighter future and uh and and communists i mean the the communists the moment they had the, the first bit of power the moment communists uh took power in russia and that's even before and that's even before the uh, the the civil war in the civil war in Russia. Um, the, the communists and even Lenin himself said that we have to project strength. We have to use every form of brutality. We have to kill, 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 because we have to be seen as strong. And, uh, and there's no other way but to be seen as strong. Even internally, we have to get rid of anybody uh, who is who is not loyal to the cause. And so now in the West, there's people who, who feel powerless and they're very frustrated. And here comes this new movement, this new right-wing esoteric pro-Russian movement, and they promise a better future. And, um, and it's like um, when, uh, when Peterson is, is, is conflating you know, masculinity and, and he's conflating it with the Russians and, and their decision to go to war, um, it's, it almost becomes like this might makes right Okay, it's like as long as something is looks like a Roman Empire, something claims to be Christian, something claims to be traditional, um, strength is good. Strength is is acceptable, and and this is what we we have to go for. This is what what we we go after, and and so the crimes of Russia, the evil of Russia, is then redefined as strength. Uh, and I think this is the great problem that that the new right wing. Um, has because they they now they glorify evil and they believe it is strength because they they believe they're fighting what, this this what, other you think, enemy. You think that 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 MAGA does this? Um, well, I mean, uh, Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump is is not knowledge enough. Um, 
when it comes to politics in the other empires. I mean, Donald Trump was occupied with casinos and real estate and beauty contests and that sort of thing. But um, when it comes to Putin, Putin, I mean, in the Tucker interview, Putin talked about the thousand year anniversary of the Russian Empire in 1862. And um, he's he was all about projecting that strength. I mean, we know he has a tremor. Uh, in his hand, he has restless feet um, and, and that sort of thing. And But Putin wanted to project strength. He is not phased by the, the sanctions. He's not phased by weapons deliveries. He threatens nuclear weapons. And he gives the interview to Tucker Carlson in the Kremlin Palace. So it's all about projecting that image of uh, that image of strength. And, um, and I think Jordan Peterson is not giving his audience a... Um, a clear enough understanding, you know, when exactly does strength, when exactly is strength evil? And when is, is, when can somebody who is degenerate or a system that is degenerate, when can it appear very strong? And self-marketing, you know, I mean, where is the line? Where is the line for Jordan Peterson? At what point will he abandon Russia? At what point will Jordan Peterson, okay, say, that's enough, I've reached my limit, I'm out of this. Is there even such a point? Because we've seen this over and over again, you know, that people did not have uh, a red line. You know, they accepted the they accepted the gulags, they accepted um, the the the, uh, the the clean, you know, the political cleansing in, in the Soviet Union. They accepted the wars in Korea and Vietnam. They accepted everything, and they even would have accepted a nuclear attack by by the Soviet Union because they have no line. So I, I think the the question would be to Jordan Peterson and his followers, where is that line? At what point would you not accept Russia? I mean, even in its day-to-day -day evil, even when it's like these, these poor Russian girls that they find in these remote villages and they take the prettiest girls and they ship them you know, to the cities to these rich customers, these powerful people... It's like what, what Jeffrey Epstein did is, is just a common Tuesday in Russia. I mean, there's so many of these Epstein-type characters in Russia. Uh, it's a common occurrence, you know. Uh, and uh, you can't point at Jeffrey Epstein and say the West is degenerate, we need the Russians, when you ignore all the knowledge and the data we have on human trafficking in Russia. I mean, it's not just Ukraine and it's not just... Um, just one, two, three other things. It's so many things that really well, tell Russia us. Russia was the heroin capital of the world where it had the most heroin addiction and they were trafficking all that heroin from <laughs> Afghanistan. And of course, this goes back to the Soviet Union uh, where they were trying to pump the West full of heroin and ended up contaminating themselves. Yeah, and the Russia, process. I mean, I, I said this when, when we talked about the, the Tucker interview with Putin. Putin's grand empire of a thousand plus years has been literally dying for decades it's an empire that is literally dying the people don't want to have babies even when the government pays them a bunch of a bunch of money for it um there's there's quite a lot of muslim migration uh, that people don't want to uh, acknowledge uh, outside of russia a lot of muslim migration um, lots of demographic problems, lots of AIDS. People, many people don't know that. There's, there's a, a staggering, alarming number of AIDS cases in Russia. Well, when you get a lot of uh, intravenous drug users, you get AIDS that comes along with that. Yeah, and it's like um, the, the, the alcoholism, the rampant alcoholism. I mean, it's like, it's like when Jordan Peterson talks about this in his, his book, these 12 rules for life. You should face reality. You should face your pain, not numb yourselves with alcohol and stupid, stupid stuff. Look at what the Russians, the average Russians are doing this. They're drinking like crazy. Yeah. They just want to get through their day. And, uh, and there's so many examples and, and the domestic violence. You know, this is not like uh, some, some people in the West, um, not like some people in the West interpret this, that you have a strong patriarchy in Russia and it's very Christian and the man is, is sort of running the household and everything's idyllic. No, it's like these, alcoholic, these, these alcoholics in, in Russia, they beat their women. Sometimes they beat their women to death. They beat their children. They abuse their children. Uh, and sometimes these children run away and then it's just they're, they're sniffing glue on the outskirts of Moscow. I mean, it's like this is degeneracy 
and it's everywhere mm -hmm. in Russia. So why is Jordan Peterson failing in a baseline and, level? And the average Russian, the the abortion rate in Russia is higher than in the U.S. Yeah, it's you know? not, it, and it's, the church attendance. I mean, they their church attendance yeah. on Easter is about four percent. I think it's down to three or two percent now, but before the pandemic it was four percent well church attendance in, on Easter in the United States is uh, around 10 times that yeah you and, know? I, and it's, so it's it's not what just are they talking about it's not just Ukraine and at some point people would just run out of excuses to blame everybody else for Russia's problem. So you can blame the West for, you know, Russia attacking Ukraine. You can try that till you're blue in the face. But what about these 500 other existential problems uh, that Russia has? Uh, you can't just blame everybody else for it. You know, you can't blame Western globalists for it, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, and uh, and so, what is what is Jordan Peterson's what is Jordan Peterson's goal? What is his positive, utopian view on the future? What does he actually want to see? And how realistic is that? Is that view? You know, I mean, they call they used to call it uh, Pax Romana. You know, it's it's the it's the Roman concept of peace. Once you don't have enemies anymore, once you have, uh, especially not internal enemies, when you control the territory, uh, you have this sort of rule established, and then you you have a, a, a it's it's more quiet. You know, it's a quiet phase of the empire, and this is called Pax Romana. I mean, is is that what uh, Peterson is is looking for? Because that's a very old concept. I mean, that's been around for for millennia. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think Peterson is looking for that. Um, uh, I think that it's something different. I think that with Peterson, I, I think that. Um, he sees the you know a lot of people on the right they see the enemy as this political correctness as um wokeism and that's what they're confronted with that's what they're having to deal with um and and of course it was peterson was confronted with this at the university that he worked at and um people literally get their careers destroyed they get destroyed by that so in a way the internal enemy the left becomes the the main enemy and anybody outside the society that seems to be at odds with this these woke people are obviously allies and i think that's that's maybe but that's very simplistic thinking the enemy of my enemy is not necessarily my friend he could be but maybe he's just another enemy that helps set up the other enemy which is what it actually the case is in this situation yeah and it's like uh when you when you quote old stuff from uh, from Carl Gustav Jung, when you mention some of these concepts and you throw around some of these phrases, I mean, it's, so, it's sort of like an easy way to appear very intelligent and to appear very knowledge. It's like uh, people can emulate this. They just copy what Jordan Peterson does and they just repeat some of these phrases and they appear like they are knowledge and they they have answers to all these questions. But when it comes down to, okay, so what's the plan? What's the actual plan? It's just a very broad, you know, broad concept of we need tradition and we need, you know, the make the, your bed. Ma exactly, <laughs> right? make it's your bed. Or, what was it? What was the make other thing? Bed. Play with a stray cat and 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 yeah. you know, buy don't, a skateboard. Don't mess with skateboarders. I think. Don't, yeah, yeah, don't mess one. with skateboarders. And things. it's like it's like wait a minute. You, you're supposed to be this this sage. You're supposed to be this shaman of mystical powers and. Uh, and then you're giving me this uh, 1910, um, you know, conservative talking points from Europe, you know, mm -hmm. that that were around back then. Uh, yeah. It's it's just it's just not going to do it. I mean, we're facing we're facing some some very sophisticated empires with very sophisticated intelligence capabilities and these these russian these russian intelligence services they have some of the best shrinks in the world i mean shrinks that are better or better suited for these things than uh, jordan peterson they're going after people like they're shrinks that are going after people like peterson to turn yeah. them into agents of influence <laughs> yeah and so it's, <laughs> this, i always tell people i always military every psychology time, Every time somebody, everybody, every time somebody says to me, "Well, you don't need books. I don't need books. It's it's not it's not necessary. It's silly. 
Uh, it's just like school, you know, it's just annoying. And, and, and every time somebody says that, I, I reply with, you are dealing with some very sophisticated empires and they employ the smartest people they can find. So you're going up against um, some people that have 150 IQ. Uh, and and they have they have a th more than a thousand years of experience in, in in running an empire. So these are the people you're going up against. Uh, so don't think for a minute you can just you know toss around some slogans like like a magic spell mm -hmm. to to fa you know to to. Especially if you crib the slogan from the enemy, and not without even realizing it. <laughs> you're really a silly person. <laughs> Anyway, well, we've been going for three hours now or more. We better stop. So um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'm Jeff Nyquist in the United States. This has been Friends and Enemy Enemies, and uh, it's been Alex. Been nice to be with Alex Benish in Germany, and I hope you'll join us again in the future. Thank you.